All right, so I'm going to call a meeting to order uh, of the select board at uh, 6.31 p.m. on February 12th, 2018. Um, first thing we start with opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. Is there anything on the agenda that anyone needs to uh, comment on or change or add to it, delete from it, et cetera? Ooh. If not, then I think we'll start with uh, public comment. Is anyone here for public comment not related to a agenda item? If so, please come forward. Um, we'll just while you're coming up, we'll do what we usually do, which is we'll listen to you carefully. We'll generally not react or offer any comment or, or uh, commentary at that time, but we'll we'll take what you have to say under advisement. So please just identify yourself at the microphone. And my name is Bill L. Sasser. I live in the Ann Whalen. I, uh, I am now a bit frightened walking further than Xana uh, toward the university on the main drag. Uh, archipelago's statements uh, notwithstanding. Uh, and I, I would like to propose uh, a bridge of flowers uh, analog down in that area, which might mitigate the uh, awfulness of it. Uh, Arguably, there is some awfulness there. Uh, and I, I don't know if I could afford to provide a, a solenoid for such a, uh, a community movement, perhaps elder, elderly retired people working together to implement some lush, non, uh, S, some lush uh, aesthetic as opposed to the grayness uh, of the building uh that that's all i have to say thank you all right no one else anyone else here for public comment related to some if you're wanting to speak to something that's on the agenda we'll get to you when we get to that agenda item so if you're here for just a general public comment now would be the time but if not we'll wait till we get to that point in the agenda and i assume that's the case okay so we'll move right into our uh, <clears throat> our action and discussion items. First up is the second quarter budget update, and we have um, Ms. Aldrich here, and we have a memo in our packet related to that. So I'd like to come forward. Okay, thank you. Good evening. This is going to be really quick tonight. I've had a few comments lately about, oh, you're not going to read that whole letter. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to read the whole letter. Um, this letter will be, this um, report will be posted on the, is posted on the accounting website, so anybody that wants to go and read uh, where we're at at the second quarter, it, it's there. If anybody has any problems getting to it, they can call the accounting office. So. Sec on the second quarter, there's really nothing different from any of the other second quarters we've done over the last 10 years, so I'm not going to bother reading through the whole thing. I'm just going to point out a few of the highlights that stuck out for me. Uh, I wanted to mention that Cherry Hill is up 15% from last year at this time. However, it does continue to be less than they were historically on the revenue side talking here. The fines and forfeits are higher than usual, and that's due to a large zoning violation penalty that was penalty and interest that was paid recently. Um, penalties and interest. Hey, jump, jump in. That's the presidential payment. Just. Oh, I didn't know if I should say that <laughs> live or not. <laughs> uh, pen penalties and interest are up. Uh, a bit, they're at 55% this year from FY16, I mean from FY17, and they were up 55% from FY16, and we're just watching this to see what the new trend is here. On the expenditure side, um, the salary, we have a salary reserve in there for some of the uh, contractual agreements that aren't settled yet. So that tends to skew the percentages in departmental budgets because this is all budgeted in the um, employee benefits section of the budget. 
until those are settled and then we move the funds at, in, at the annual town meeting. The only other things that stick out are st we'll probably be going to the Finance Committee for a Reserve Transfer for the uh, fire department boiler, the North Amherst Fire Department boiler that went down. That was approximately 62000 I don't have a total cost yet for that. And then there's snow and ice. We don't know where we're going to end up with snow and ice this year. It seems to be another year like last year where we have a lot of nuisance storms. They still have to go out and sand and stuff. And the other big section that is concerning is employee benefits. This is where we pay our, all of our employee benefits, including retirement. This is also where the appropriations are for health insurance. Um, we had budgeted for the first increase at 10% to the PPLs, but we did not budget for the second and third increases. And uh, it's our hope that we can raise, the, we can pay this deficit <coughs> with um, savings in the operating budget. We're aggressively working with department heads to uh, stop any discretionary spending and trying to control it so that we can. Um, and that's it. I told you I was quick. Any questions? Mr. Steinberg? Yeah, I guess uh, just had one, and that was on the uh, hotel motel tax, which is running at 61.9%. Uh, on a year-to-date basis, and I was wondering if those come in evenly per month and, or if there's some other explanation, or are we actually running ahead this year? They come in on the um, monthly. They're not, they're not the same amount every month. It's whatever the usage is for that. This is through November for hotel motel. So if it's through November, that's five months. Mm -hmm. So we actually are exceeding estimate on that one. Right. You're talking hotel mot just hotel trying. motel. Okay. Yeah. I got the UMass payment in lieu of in my head. Yes. It's only through November. And does the UMass um, show in that line or does it show in um the the revenues for um, the UMass hotel it's a payment in lieu. It's not a pilot, but it's just a payment. That's under um, non-recurring revenue, so it's in a different line item completely. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Brewer. Thank you. It would be helpful in future if under miscellaneous non-recurring, it's fine if it's just in the text, if you could break out which part of that's the UMass part and which part of it's the Amherst College part, that would be great in terms of the non-recurring, just because it shows a total, but I don't know what that represents. Okay. That can be done. Thanks. Other questions or comments regarding the budget? Thank you. Oh. I did actually have one other quick one. You mentioned the boiler, and we've certainly talked about the boiler before, but where will that fit under, where will that, what category will that end up in when you end up writing this report in the future? It's in public safety. Okay. It's under. It's in the fire department budget under um, new equipment okay. in building maintenance. So that's where it'll be. Great. Thank you. Just to follow on that, will there be, or have you considered using any ambulance funds, ambulance funds reserve for whatever I forget the name of the fund, but any, any ambulance reserve funds for mitigating or reducing that cost of it being out of the general fund? It's or or. I'm not sure that's possible because it really doesn't have to do with the medical side. I know it's heating the building that holds the ambulances and stuff, but I'm not sure to it's check into that a little more, yeah. A lot of little expense. I just was thinking maybe some portion because, you know, obviously it's a fire operation, and but that's an integral part. I didn't know whether or not the... Yeah, we normally use the ambulance funds just for ambulance or uh, medical equipment right. for the ambulances or in payroll. Right. We don't know... So I do note in that line at a meeting I was at recently mm -hmm. that um, the fire chief, um, Chief Nelson, did make the comment that um, there is a heating requirement in order to maintain medical supplies at the adequate temperature that is required. There's a rationale. Check into it. Mm -hmm. All right. Fantastic. Any other questions or comments? 
Thank you very much. So I'm going to um, alter the agenda a little bit. I was it was pointed out to me that uh, we have a we have a Chapter 61A uh, notice of intent to withdraw a parcel from a from a section of uh, Chapter 61A land, and it's a s relatively small item. And we have someone here that uh, is here for that purpose. So I think we'll skip ahead, barring a, any comment from my colleagues, uh, to to to. Uh, Item 4E, which is Chapter 61A, Notice of Intent to Withdraw. And I think in our circumstances, um, generally we have a right of first refusal. But Mr. Uh, Zomek, if you could kind of walk us through this particular piece. <coughs> he was thinking he was going to get this much later, so it's not quite. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Dave Zomek, Assistant Town Manager. Um, I'm actually joined. Um, the owner of the property in question is here behind me tonight. Um, Ms. Edelman is here, so if there are any specific questions that the board may have, um, I'm sure she could answer uh, perhaps more specific questions than I can. Um, this is a somewhat unusual uh, situation um, for us, and I realize that uh, we're asking the board to uh, move a little more quickly than is, is your practice. Um, um, in short, um, before you on the screen, and for those folks at home, uh, there is a... Um, the property in question is here, and the sliver of land that we're talking about, which is in Chapter 61A, is three-tenths of an acre. It is right here. It is a tiny sliver of land that um, Ms. Edelman needs um, because um, her well for her house uh, was actually determined to be on that property. So she needs to add that small sliver of land from property owned by Coles to her property so that she can eventually sell her property. Um, and um, although the planning board uh, and the conservation commission typically weigh in on these, I realize before they reach you, um, uh, I think given that there is a uh, impending closing uh, on the property, we, we uh, we're doing everything we could to try to move this process along fairly quickly. I have been in uh, direct contact with Christine Brestrup. Um, she is very confident that the um, planning board would not recommend to you that the town exercise our right of first refusal on 0 .03 acres of land, um, nor would, uh, I can say with, with some certainty, that uh, we would not be interested in this parcel for conservation purposes. So. Um, I did check in with town council, Sharin Everett, and there is nothing legally that prohibits you from doing one of two things, either voting to not exercise your right of first refusal this evening, or voting, uh, one option, another option would be to vote to not exercise your right of first refusal pending uh, a vote from the planning board and the conservation commission. Um, I think given the circumstances, um, I feel very confident that the planning board uh, nor the conservation commission would recommend to you to exercise the town's right of first refusal on this tiny sliver of land. So I'm happy to give way to the owner of the property if you have more specific questions. And I hope I covered that well. Does the select board have any questions relative to this? Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah Mr. Zamek. Uh, wouldn't the th a third option be to, not that I'm s suggesting it, but just to make sure we get all the options on the table, to approve it subject to the approval of the Planning Board and Conservation Commission as opposed to the negative? I might have said that wrong. I think that was what I was trying to say. Um, my only concern there is that, um, and perhaps the owner could speak more to this than I can, but. Uh, I know they have a closing date coming up. The Conservation Commission will take this up um, Wednesday night, the 14th. Um, but the Planning Board, uh, due to some scheduling challenges last week with the snowstorm and whatnot, um, it may be a few weeks before they can get this on the agenda again. So I don't know if the my closing is no, microphone. And just identify yourself with the mic so the folks at home know. Who you are? Oh, I'm Deborah Edelman. Thank you. And I'm, this, I, I don't feel this famous except when the Patriots are playing, so I'm <laughs> excited to see my name up there. <laughs> um, my closing is February 20th, and it was already extended 
Um, it was supposed to be January 31st. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Brewer. So recognizing both that deadline and the fact that we need enough time to make these decisions. That's why these come to us with a certain time frame on them, and we're trying to make it shorter already. And so I'm a little frustrated that we're being told that it's not fast enough when we're actually trying to do it faster than normal. And this is not the first property owner who has, who has worked with us and been frustrated by the timeliness of the process. But I can also appreciate that in this particular circumstance, the planning board had that weather issue and would have done it last week. It's still cutting it close um, for the 20th because our clo your closing date is not our problem. But in terms of us you know, doing our due diligence, et cetera, from what Mr. Zomek has reported, I'm not in the mood to fight about it. There's not further comment I would entertain a motion okay I move to not exercise the town's first ref uh, right of first refusal a right of refusal option in accordance with Mass General Law chapter 61a section 14 to purchase three-tenths of an acre owned by WD Coles said land off of Shutesbury Road abutting the land town is, I'm going to stop for a second. Is it Shutesbury or Pelham? It's in Amherst. I know, but what town line is it abutting? Abutting the town. No. The motion, With the, the motion says Pelham, it's but um, Pelham doesn't run up that way. Shutesbury runs up that way. This is your problem with knowing geography. Yeah, I think I'm just going to uh, maybe remove That's those words. Idea. I'm going to pause for a moment and I'm going to um, ask if I may, Mr. Chair, just ask Mr. Zomack about this. Yes. can just be deleted. That's what we were wondering, too, because I'm not. Because we have a map and parcel number. Yeah. I think it's Shutesbury, but I'd rather than correct the, if it's, it's really not necessary. So I'm going to um, start the motion over again. Please. And I move to not exercise the town's first right of refusal option in accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 61A, Section 14, to purchase approximately three tenths acres owned by W.D. Coles, said land off of Shutesbury Road, Assessor's Map, Parcel 1D, 9B-11. So got a motion and a second. Is there further comment? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. I'm, no, oh. I'm abstaining. Oh, you're abstaining. Okay. One abstention. Thank you. Got ahead of myself. Listen, but you don't, you know, if you don't count the hands. <laughs> so we, that would be uh, 401. All right. Thank you very much. With that. Thank you for coming in. Yes, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going to put Mr. Zomek on wheelchair you should have a wheelchair tonight because i'm going to go back to our original order which is the next on our agenda is the group health insurance update uh so mr bachman do you want to bring that forward for a moment no yes more. thank you mr chair um with us tonight if miss aldridge who's our comptroller and patrick brock who <laughs> chairs the town's employee health insurance advisory committee and um i just wanted to give you some updates on where we are um so as you know the town is insures its employees along with the town of Pelham and the Amherst Regional School District through the Amherst Pelham Health Claims Trust. It's a legal entity formed in 1986 uh, by, the, by Amherst Pelham and, and the district to pay claims and administer the health insurance programs for its employees and retirees. So this is, we are not an insurance company. We are a trust where the money from the town that contributes to employees 
um, health insurance and from the employees that we deduct from the paychecks goes into the trust, and then all the claims that the, that the employees and retirees incur are paid out of the trust. Um, so that's why you have heard me talk before about the volatility of the, of the trust. When the experience of the trust is good, meaning fewer claims than the money coming in, we benefit from that. But when the claims uh, exceed our revenue, we, we, that's a bad thing, and that's what's been happening over the last uh, period of time. Um, we have, over the last year alone, we've increased, uh, on July 1, we increased the HMO rate by 10%. On uh, October 1, we increased both plans by 10, the HMO and the PPO by 10%. And then on February 1, we increased the plans uh, by 100 for individual 200, which is about a 14 or 16% increase. Um, the, we, um, so, but we have a problem with it now. And so we've engaged our employee group, which is represented through the Insurance Advisory Committee to talk about solutions to the problem. The, what's the problem? The problem is that we have a very large number of large claims. Um, and this has been going on for a while now. And while we have reinsurance, which means we buy insurance to cover the large claims, that doesn't kick in until the, the um, claim hits $250,000. So the trust has to pay the first $250,000 of the claim. We've had a number of those over the years, and um, I've summarized those in the, in the um, in the memo that you have in front of you, uh, the, free, the frequently asked questions. Ad additionally, um, we have had, we've benefited over the years by having the trust um, have lower than you would expect premiums. And when there are no increases to premiums, that benefits the, the employees, but it also benefits the two towns and the district because we're not in, uh, um, appropriating funds for the trust. Um, so while in the past years we have benefited, it's, the experience has uh, deteriorated where we have had to make these, and these increases on, into the trust. So the, when you make an increase to the trust, when you do an increase to the trust, it comes out of the town's coffers as, and the school's coffers as well as the uh, employee's pocket. So it's both parties get hit by this. Um, to put it in perspective, we are we are self-insured trust. Our neighboring communities, like the, the city of Northampton and the University of Massachusetts, not a city, but major um, uh, employer, uh, are part of the Group Insurance Commission. The Group Insurance Commission is the state-run health plan uh, that that the, that the city or the town could participate in if we so chose. Um, so when this problem began to um, rear its head, we engaged the employee group through the Insurance Advisory Committee, which Mr. Brock chairs, and he does a tremendous job of chairing it. Uh, it's a large committee, uh, 14 members. Uh, every bargaining unit in the, in the town and in the schools is represented at the table and, has, and can participate in the discussion. Um, and th we've identified three things that we have to address. First is, do we want to stay self-insured as a trust or not? Or do we want to go out and buy insurance? And the key question on that is who, who is going to bear the risk? The risk is if you are fully insured, as you would imagine, you pay a premium every month or you pay the premium for the year, and the insurance company, if the, if the experience is bad, they absorb it. If the experience is good, they get the benefit of it. But in either case, they absorb the risk. Um, the, um, the second one was we offer two carriers now. One is Harvard um, Pilgrim Health and the other is Blue Cross Blue Shield. And having two, our employees split almost evenly between those two plans, uh, those two um, carriers makes it difficult uh, for us to assemble ourselves and market ourselves out if we want to seek something, a different uh, type of coverage. So one of the things that we would like to do is to eliminate one of the two plans. When you look at the plans side by side, there's 99 to 100% overlap. So if you are in Harvard Health, there's a 100% chance based on your, that your primary care physician is going to be covered by Blue Cross. If you're on Blue Cross and, you, and we wanna to switch to Harvard Health, um, there's a 99% chance. And if it's not, if the, if the uh, physician is not covered, Blue Cross will go out to that 
person and offer them a contract to say, would you like to be able to take this, the Blue Cross plan? Um, so the first one was uh, whether we want to stay self-insured or go fully insured. The second one is to have just one carrier that offers, and we still offer two plans, HMO and PPO. HMO means that you're in the network. PPO is a little more expensive, but it allows you to use the network of the HMO or go outside the network to the PPO with certain conditions. Um, the, um, and then the third item that, we wanted, that we've talked a lot about is plan design. And right now the town offers first dollar coverage, uh, which is unusual to say the least in, in um, health insurance industry now. Uh, we look at, again, the GIC communities. We also look at the Hampshire County Trust, which insures about 70 small towns um, in, the, in Western Massachusetts. They have a plan through Blue Cross that mimics uh, in, a, in a large measure the GIC plan. And then we look at private employers too in terms of what they are offering their employees because that's our competitive environment. Um, what we're trying to do is get to what I call intelligent plan design, something where our employees can migrate to that uh, as we look at their experience and uh, we, we've determined whether they are um, utilizing all the benefits that we're paying for. Sometimes they're not utilizing all the benefits that we're paying for and it, it might not be as hard a request. Um, the goals as we talk about this with the Insurance Advisory Committee is um, with the three increases we had this year, we don't want to live through that again next year. We just don't want to be there. And so we want stability. Um, we, want to, we want to be in a place that gives us options. Uh, so consolidating the risk pool into one group gives us options. Um, the stability we'd like to see is you can't look very far ahead in the insurance market, especially health insurance, but we'd like stability and predictability for at least two years. So it'd be FY19 and FY20. Uh, and then in terms of our plan design, we'd like to bring, start to beginning to bring our benefits in line with other uh, communities and with uh, the university and everybody else that's out there in terms of um, what we're offering. Um, it's a complex conversation to have at the insurance advisory level. Um, Mr. Brock does it. It's it's a it's a large number of people there, and then there's even you know probably three times that many people who are very concerned employees mostly, uh, who are in the audience observing, um, and we've had very structured conversations about this. There's a small group that that um, that he, that we gathered together to sort of dig deeper into some of these issues, and then. Uh, on last Friday afternoon, we brought these their their research back to the full group. Uh, the timing of this is if we are to change on July 1, which it means that we start making deductions from employee paychecks on June 1st, which means that uh, we need to have the actual Blue Cross cards in people's hands uh, by that time. Blue Cross typically needs um, Two months, you know, two months, six to eight weeks to implement to get all the cards because that's the most important thing to our employees. They don't. It's not fair to the employees to have make a change in them. Not and something happens on July fourth and they're not. They go to the hospital and their card doesn't work. It has to work. It has to be tested. Um, so we're on a very tight time frame and we've been at this for a few months now. Um, but our goal is to make a decision by end of February, early March so that we can have a direction on where we need to go. Uh, in the, in, in during this process, we have a major commitment to doing a lot of employee education on what the changes mean to them and giving them, and most people, uh, when you have a group meeting, their questions aren't um, important. They don't want to ask their question in public, so there's a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, and we would have people from Blue Cross um, in here or representatives from the, whoever we buy the insurance from um, here to walk people through who's, who's your provider, what does it look like, how does it look for you in terms of how this new design would look like. Um, so that's where we are. It's a, a major financial challenge for, for the town. Uh, our experience over the last year has not been great in, t in the sense that we can, our claims continue to come in at a very high rate. and. One of the other challenges that happens when you switch to a fully insured program is like right now, 
we will, if the claims that we incur in May and June, they won't come in as bills until July and August. So we are responsible for those bills. So there's, it's the tail run out, whatever you want to call it. Some people call it IBNR incurred, but not reported. Um, we have to factor that into the price as well. And we would want, and that's, so in essence, we will be paying 14 months of claims uh, over a 12 month period. And, and so we have to raise those funds. Um, we can work on that to um, extend that over a two year payback period, but we still have to come up with the money. So um, once we have the group consolidated, if we get to fully insured and we see where we are with that, after two years, um, we can look at this again. And if we say we'd like to go back to being self-insured, we have that option. If we feel like whatever insurance we go to isn't adequate, we can look at that. Uh, there are a number of options. But the key piece right now is that we have to take action. I think the insurance advisory committee, the employees who are participating in that are really well educated on, the, on this, on this um, challenge that we face and have been pretty open to having a frank discussion. It's not an easy one because they feel it's a degradation of benefits, which it is, um, but they, it's one that they've come to understand and educate themselves about. Um, those are the people in the room. There's a lot of people out there who are just working their regular jobs who um, this will hit them and they'll, we have to talk to them about it as well. So I just wanted to have this opportunity to talk to you. There's no action from the board um, and um, Ms. Aldridge and Mr. Brock are here. If you have questions for them or comments from them, I'm not sure if either one of you want to say anything, but um, I want to bring it to your attention because it's a big issue. It's something we'll, you will hear a lot about as we focus on town meeting and appropriations for this year and for next year. And we, the um, finance director, just as a side note, the, the schools are the largest employee group. The finance director from the schools is intimately involved in our, all of our conversations. Anything else you'd like to add either? Mr. Brock or Ms. Aldrich, do you either one want to offer any? Do you have a question for me? Or? No, just do you have anything you wanted to offer as far as, you know, information for us as far as uh, process and what you've discovered, discussed, uh, et cetera? Patrick Brock, uh, an Amherst Town employee retiree and uh, retiree representative on the Insurance Advisory Committee and, and the chair. That was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> the, I'm, I'm really uh, pleased with what we've done in the last year as far as organization. Our insurance advisory committee over the last 10 years, out of the 14 members, we'd get six or eight at each meeting. When this started blowing up in, in June and July, um, our attendance increased and we've had uh, full attendance at every single meeting and we've been meeting a lot. Um, when it was first proposed uh, that we needed an additional increase in um, sometime in December or January after doing two increases, um, there was a lot of pushback and there was a lot of education, a lot of um, outside meetings, outside communications and stuff. Um, I was overwhelmed and pleased that we voted unanimously to authorize the increase February 1st. Um, what we're looking at now, and hopefully that will take us to the end of the year, but we've had some recent negative information that, that that's going to be difficult. I think the town manager has put together a plan. Uh, I constantly remind the town manager and the committee uh, that it's the town, of, it's the uh, insurance administrator's duties to set forth the program, and it's the ad insurance advisory committee to either support it or oppose it. Um, uh, he has asked for the committee's input. He's a good listener. Uh, we've uh, adjusted a few things um, and we've moved forward. Um, I'm not sure uh, that, that there are several difficult subjects coming up um, uh, that can derail our efforts. Uh, and I'm not sure what the outcome is. is. We'll keep working on that. Um, and what I'm most pleased with is the communications between the town management staff and the committee members. Um, it is a significant financial event. Um, working with the retirement board, I know what those are like. Um, and I, I understand where the town is coming from. Although there's massive increases for the employees, 
uh, to come up with the balance of that money from the town and the 75% contribution is, is three times what we're suffering. So um, we'll, we are meeting the 20th? Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> and we will try our best to, to go as fast as we can. Um, we're kind of pushing it along. But what we're looking at is a, is a um, as the town manager outlined to you, is a plan starting July 1st. Uh, hopefully that plan would avoid any further premium increases for a year or so if we um, do the actions that he's recommended. Um, and we've discussed all those actions. And in fact, the education for the last meeting was about deductibles and co-pays and how they are applied. And I think that there was a lot of uh, recognition that they weren't what they presumed to be. Um, and we had representatives from Blue Cross Blue Shield helping us. We were getting the facts straight from the insurer. Um, so it was very, very helpful. And um, we just have to keep lobbying. Um, town manager can go into other issues that, that will rise. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have a vote and, and the, the issues that we have would be resolved, but there are other issues, collective bargaining issues and other issues that are gonna have to be addressed. Thank you. Questions for the manager, Mr. Brock? Mr. Steinberg? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Brock, for the, what you're doing, and I'm not gonna ask the question of what part of your life plan, whether it was serving on the committee, being retired, or chairing the committee, that you were thinking <laughs> might be a mistake, but please don't answer that. That's not what I was Less really wanting to ask. Last time with my granddaughter is a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that is always a mistake. Um, the um, one question that struck me as I was reading the memo in advance is that um, it doesn't really set forth any information about um, how many claims in the total dollar value of claims that fall between $100,000 and $250,000? Because the way the memo is structured, it, it talks only about the number of claims over $100,000. But um, that got me to wonder whether there was an option that was considered and rejected or not, or not considered about um, seeing if the stop loss insurance could be rewritten to trigger a lower amount. So we, we, when we went out to bid, we looked at, uh, we only had one, per, one company bid on our reinsurance last year, and they bid at 250000 and we would like to move that down to one twenty five or something like that. Um, but that's a, we'd have to bid that out and negotiate with the um, reinsurer. Um, the, um, it, it, there are some that exceed the 250,000, and then there are some claims that they, what they, the term is called laser out. They say, these three claims we know are gonna be recurring, so we're going to not address them until you hit to the, the 500,000 mark, because they know that's a, that's a known expense to the uh, insurance company. So it's a pretty, they're not in the business of losing money. They're, they, they know our group, they know our claims. Um, so the idea of giving you the $100,000 threshold was to give you a sense of the number of large claims, and that's really where the, the claims activity is. And it's, you know, if you have four claims at two, up to 250000 even if they don't exceed that, that's a million dollars right there. And that's what we feel is driving our experience. I think one of the, the points in, in my time on the Insurance Advisory Committee is that we used to work be, uh, six to eight claims over $100,000. And now we're up to 12 to 14 claims, and that makes all the difference in the world. It isn't one or two big $800,000 claims because we've got the reinsurance. Um, I think the committee has always followed the lead of the trust administrator, which is the town manager. Um, we kind of got lulled into a good feeling with premium holidays and 0% increases. Um, and when they said, well, we've got problems, Oh, how, com how bad can it be? And we probably waited too long before acting, and they are this bad. Um, the other thing is I'm very well aware of benchmarking and, and the relationship to that exists. Um, I don't think the people involved are that aware of benchmarking. Ms. Gruber. Um, I just want to make a couple comments, and I, I will... Um so I think it's okay if I make comments, but I will disclose that I am... Uh, 
I benefit by being a retiree, so this affects me, but I'm trying to, I'm really speaking from a bigger point of view. Um, in following this one, I, well, I have a lot of faith in both, both the manager and, and Mr. Brock. I've known you a long time, and I think that you do this with a lot of uh, skill and integrity. So um, I, I think people have approached this, trying to manage the situation. And it kind of caught it, kind of caught up with us because it was going so well. It's kind of like you don't know how good you got it till it's gone. Um, in terms of having low premiums and a healthy trust fund, but I agree with Mr. Bachelman that we can't face this year after year. Even if we had a good year in two years, this up and down, it's um, it's not really acceptable because it makes it too hard to manage. I. I'm expecting that whatever changes we make, and I do believe we have to make changes, it's going to cost more money. I mean, it'll cost the, both the, you know, the town for their percentage share and the recipients more, um, whether it's because we have a group insurance, we have an insurance provider that is going to go up. And, but I think we have to understand that that's what's going to happen. And then I was um, struck, it's in the memo, but also we've talked about this before, that if Amherst offers a better plan, maybe it's the you know the right level of benefit, but if it's better than the employers around us, we will attract people to choose that as their family plan provider, and that's just the reality. So it's a little bit like parking. If you don't charge enough, <laughs> then they're going to park here and not there. Um, so they're going to, um, and I, I've seen this other places I've worked too. So it's just. In pe you know, it's the rational thing to do. If it's a better program, you switch over. So I think we, we have to really be mindful of keeping the benefits pretty comparable to what else is being done by whether it's the university or other large employers or even some of the smaller ones. And I think that's just the new reality. And we have to go into that. But it's going to be a hard transition. It didn't help when the GIC made their changes and the pushback from those changes resulted them in changing their vote. Um, there are still members of the committee that believe we can do nothing. We can go ahead and stay self-insured and manage our way out of here. I'm not sure that that's possible and I'm not sure that that's uh, financially effective. Um, uh, I try not to vote to, to uh, uh, unless there's a tie or something. Uh, I, I have voted on, on several of the motions, but uh, um, w most, of the, most of the members, all will, we have representation from non-union members, most of them are bargaining members. Um, they are very involved in their own bargaining, and, and so this, you know, I got, from my old days, when we bargained health insurance in the contracts, yeah, it was a total package. Um, when we've taken health insurance pretty much out of it, um, it has an effect on the town's ability to give increases and stuff. And we have to get people to understand that, that that's real and that you're getting a benefit in continued health insurance, you know. So it, it's not an easy, easy thing to do. Other questions or comments? Ms. Sure. Ms. So um, starting in a random place might as well follow up on the GIC conversation my husband's employed by UMass and we're on that plan and yes it was it was going to be a very different conversation if GIC went to only three plans and then we had employees who had the option of picking up the town of Amherst plan instead of the relatively crappy three plans GIC was going to offer and relatively crappy is indeed the technical term for the health insurance I currently have which they were going to retain and then two other options along those lines as you continue to figure out all these different puzzle pieces, which we, you have done a great job of elaborating for us at several meetings now, how all those different factors play into it. And we appreciate that you brought up both um, you know, other municipalities and then also private employers and then of course UMass, which is a whole nother kettle of fish. But in terms of, I'm assuming that it's true that it's still standard today to offer both the HMO and PPO option from at least one provider as a just as opposed to just saying you get an HMO and that's all there is. I'm assuming that's still like, you know, industry standard and that's why we would continue to do that. We're required to do that. We are required to yep. do that by what? I believe state law um, uh, or um, that requires that if I can confirm that for you. Just yeah, 
the just, end of 32B. Yeah. Okay. Just because at like this document has been and like others have been, it's really helpful to be able to point people to these things and say, this is why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. This is how we got to this point. This is why, and this, for example, is why we're doing that, is that we're offering both beyond the fact that I assume it's probably comparable to what other places are doing. It's especially comparable if it's legal. So um, that would be worth pointing out. I really appreciate the detail that you put on page two in terms of the years of premium increases and decreases for those of us who sort of remembered some of that. Um, again, having that in front of us is helpful. And so for example, in FY16, we had a premium decrease for those on the HMO, but we actually didn't increase for those in the PPO in another year we were able to just keep them at zero. So we have done lots of adjustments and I, again that's I think valuable information to show people that we've been doing these things. But speaking of pages, if we could have page numbers and a date on this document, that would be super helpful because we've had variations of this document before and I don't have any way of knowing which one's which at this particular moment in time. So that would be great. So and just jump on that. So this was a document we shared with every employee in the community, um, so they could they could sh see the information. Um, uh, can I jump on a couple other things while you're? Sure. And so. then I, I was just gonna, I was just going to ask. Could I ask one other okay. complete? Make some other complete separate comment that you've uh, you've talked about in the past, and I wanted you to remind us of, which is that, and as Mr. Brock so helpfully gave us the segue for, um, health insurance and used to be part of collective bargaining agreements is not on the town side per town quote unquote area now but it is still in the schools which of course is our largest group of employees so tell us about that again and how that's going to work because they're in the middle of bargaining right now too but that means not only instead of just taking it into account like we do for bargaining they're going to actually have to potentially change something that's in the contract or not or well, the school uh, department is in the middle of negotiations with their with their bargaining unit. So I know they were having a meeting. They may be meeting to, to right now, so I can't really comment on it. But they're aware of this situation. Both parties are aware of it, and I'm sure it's on the on the list of things that they're discussing. But, so. but what I'm saying is, it's in their contract, so they can't. No matter what they say about at the insurance advisory committee stage, there's still that separate step for them that's part of their contract? Yes, it's, it's, there's something in their contract that they have to address, but it's complicated because of course. I'm the trust administrator, but the contract is not with me. The contract is between the school committee and the, in the, bar, in the bargaining unit. The bargaining unit happens to re, uh, bargain for the regional school district and the, local, and the Amherst school committee who are town employees. Right. So the, all these things sort of weave together and um, we each have certain authorities to do. I mean, uh, and, but we don't want to, we want to get to a agreed upon place versus people saying you don't have a right to do this or I, I, I'm saying I'm going to do this whether you like it or not. That's just not a good place for it. It's not the way we interact with our employees. We really work hard and it's time consuming, it's education, and it's us listening and, and them listening. And so we work hard at not getting into that kind of confrontational mode. But both parties have certain rights, and the employees clearly, and they've art, and for the, t and the teachers, have clearly articulated that they know what their rights are. Um, they're well represented as well. Thank you. Because again, that just follows up on the whole. There are so many complicated yeah. pieces to this that, yeah. It's not just one single decision. So, thank you. Scrooge. Follow up for what Mr. Bachman said. You said this was circulated to all the employee groups? Yeah, but was it retirees. circulated so. to the retirees? I don't think it did, actually. I just want to so make a pitch that. Yeah. That, um, that was it, our bad, it, yeah. Yeah, and just because clearly retirees have a huge interest in this mm -hmm. um, as well, and um, it's easy to forget because it's a different list. Yeah. So the other thing I would uh, mention, two things. One is that, um, like Ms. Kruger, although I'm not retired, I am on the <laughs> insurance plan. Um, wish I'm retired, but not yet. Um, so it, it is, again, you know, sort of an interesting uh, situation to be in. But at the same time, um, one of the things I wanted to point out just for people to recognize is on, on the second page of this memo where you have fiscal year 13 through 18, year to date and premium increases decrease. If you go back when it was probably 15, fiscal year six or seven, there was a, uh, a similar kind of spike in costs. 
and uh, it required um, premium increases, a surcharge that was charged uh, for a period of time, uh, and significant plan design was, was altered at that point. And, and we've kind of coasted on that for a while, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I think if you're an employee that's been employed during that whole period of time, it's all sort of washed out, and it's not too bad. Um, and, and of course, the other thing for folks is that, you know, yeah, we could have just gone and put 2%, of, you know, doing a, done a 2 or 3 or 4 or 5% increase every year in all these things, and that's, you know, half what it is nationwide. But you didn't then are foregoing what you could do with that in your operating budget. Mm -hmm because this means you're not paving roads or hiring staff or doing other wonderful things we want our communities to do. And so, so these things are uh, you know, pitted against the, the other, these choices are pitted against choices of you know, things we want our, our town government to do or our schools to do for, for our citizens. And so that's part of why we try to carry the, the trust balances you know, safely and small as it can be. Um, because you know, having a bunch of money sitting there not really doing much for anybody doesn't do anybody any good, but it would at this point when we've had these high claims. But we're going to have that boom and bust cycle because we have such a small group, quite frankly. Um, and so, you know, there are things we could do around sort of maintaining a larger level of balance or a steadier percentage increase every year. But I think you don't get down to brass tacks of conversations about plan design changes, being comparable with neighbors, et cetera, et cetera, in some ways until you get to these sort of harder points in time where you know, the money's just not there and you have to make the choices. You know, it, it's hard to have that discipline. In the good years, it's hard to have the discipline and the foresight to sort of see, um, you know, how bad it can get. Um, you know, I think if you were talking to us in fiscal 14, we'd have, you know, no, you know, no sense that it was going to do anything like it's done. I mean, we might think, oh, it's going to get more expensive at some point, but not to this level. And so it is a bit of the boom and bust cycle of a small, small group. Um, which speaks a little bit to some of the suggestions about being fully insured by somebody else or, you know, other changes that are discussed there, you know, help mitigate that small group thing a little bit. Other questions or comments from the board? Hearing none, thank you, Mr. Brock, for thank coming you in. For coming in. Thank you. Oh. We'll keep you Keeping posted. Today. Uh, Ms. Ms. Slaughter, yes. I have one actual um, question that before Ms. Aldrich leaves that is really budget and um, in how this is going to be reflected into the budget as opposed to the health insurance policy issues, which were issues we were addressing to Mr. Brock. Um, the reason I brought up the uh, whole question for a while, um, during the budget discussion about that one um, line item, the hotel motel tax that was coming in over, yeah, I did some quick calculations and it seems like that's um, approximately $100,000 if you annualize it of additional revenue that we might be receiving that we didn't budget for. And um, so um, it made me realize that there are other um, variations that um, are in there and I guess the question is knowing that we have this large additional expense that we didn't budget for when the town meeting adopted the budget for the current year at the annual town meeting which is increasing the cost side because of the employer share of the um, health insurance costs um, are is there a, um, a budget plan that goes with this that can, um, and where, where do we sit with that? So as, as the claims mature, right now we have data from January 31, which is seven months into the fiscal year, and we're monitoring it on a weekly, monthly basis. Um, and once we know where we're headed, um, Ms. Aldrich makes projections all the time, and so we monitor those things. The um, the you know the deficit the the IBNR the the tail of the claims are both very large numbers that um, that the trust is responsible for paying and as a trust is a standalone entity and so the town and the employees would have to pay into the trust to make sure the trust is whole so. Um, we have ideas. We need to get a better handle on the scope and also what's going to happen in FY um, 19 and 20, and then 
and our idea is that part of the financing plan of the current deficit would be incorporated into the FY19 and 20 rates. So it would be spread over time for the employees, so it's not one like the surcharge that we talked about earlier. Of course, what I'm referring to is not the rates and not the trust, um, but the fact that when you increase the rates and they're payable in part by the town and part by the employees, part by the employees um, falls on the employees and retirees, and um, the part that's attributable to the town falls on the town so that there's an effect on the actual operating budget mm -hmm. of the town it, that's a separate entity from the trust, as you pointed right. out. So what I was really referring to is um, where we stand with the, the budget that was presented earlier and um, but going for the rest of right. the year in comparison. So I think Ms. Aldred alluded to the fact that we're, we've um, cracked down on all discretionary spending. The idea is that we are trying to reserve as much as we can in our operating budgets to because we know this problem is there and we're going to try and manage it to the best of our ability using limitations on what people are pur purchasing basically just not spending as much and hoping that we'll have surplus and not hoping expecting knowing that we will have some surpluses it's good um, right i think that's i just uh, did you want to you might want to add to my comment so i i haven't tracked before you get too excited about the hotel revenue being higher and maybe bearing that out I've noticed that that business is very cyclical. So the busy part is the fall and then later in the spring, and we're going into the quarters where that um, occupancy really falls. And I don't know if we've tracked the up cycle of hotel motel and the down, but just because we're up after the busiest part of our accommodation season doesn't tell me that we're gonna stay there because um, people just don't come here. December, January, February, and March. So I, I don't know if Ms. Aldridge has seen that kind of a pattern. I, I, I see it in some of the things I do. I'm not sure if you were asking if that would help us for fiscal year 18 or 19. We're really talking about 18, and, and I appreciate uh, the comment that was just offered by Ms. Kruger about um, any single item, including the one that she cited, you know, and I uh, <laughs> referenced earlier, may not, in fact, because of the cyclical nature of the funding, be a, be a factor. But um, at what point um, are we going to look at um, comprehensively the 18 budget to really see where we're at? Because we really are being hit with a more significant change, I think, in a line item than we're normally at, mm -hmm. and uh, it might be helpful for us and the Finance Committee to know exactly where we are um, for the overall comprehensive uh, consolidated budget um, now as compared to where we had expected to be when we adopted the budget as far as projections through the end of the year. Well, for 2018, we can't, we can't go back and look at revenues and re-estimate our revenues because our tax rate is set for 2018. So our only option for the 2018 if we um, to cover the deficit in the Health Claims Trust Fund is to have a vote from free cash from reserves. And that would go into the trust fund so that we would not have a deficit because it's legal to have an appropriation deficit, um, according to the DOR. So we'll have to have make the trust fund whole, and that's where we would have to look at what the um, surcharge would be, uh, like Mr. Slaughter alluded to back in 2006 when we had this happen before. We did institute a surcharge to pay back the general fund for those appropriations, and the town, um, the town contributed to 75 or 80 percent and the employees contributed their 25 or 30 percent or 25 or 20 percent but we can't go back and look at those revenues and increase them and say we're going to use this to pay because it would have to be an appropriation at town meeting but you can't use that anyways because of the tax rate and we do watch the trends on all of these we have huge spreadsheets that show the trend of the thing if we think it's going to stay 
a steady upward trend, then we'll adjust our budget estimates for that in normal years. Um, well, thank you. That's very helpful. And I'll just conclude it because I don't want to drag this on longer. But I think it would, if we are going to have to use um, any significant amount of free cash in order to make the budget balance at the end of the year, um, if we can offer some sort of projection to town meeting uh, before it starts, I think that it's very helpful to remind town meeting that we put in free cash. Part of the reason for um, building free cash was because unforeseen things can happen. And uh, to remind town meeting that free cash isn't a uh, just a piggy bank to go to for whatever, but that there are purposes of free cash, and this is one of them. And that's, I think, why I've driven it a little bit. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Aldrich. Thank you, Mr. Brock, for coming. Um, at this time, we'll move on to our next item on the agenda, which is uh, Rental Appeals Board Charge. Um, <clears throat> sort of sketch that out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And sketch, I might be the right word. Um, in, in your packet, you have a draft um, rental appeals board charge. As you recall, uh, the bylaw uh, anticipates the creation of a rental appeals board, um, which has not been neat necessary to, to date. Um, previously, you established the membership of the rental appeals board as being the whoever is the current chair of the, of the select board, whoever is the current chair of the planning board, whoever is the current chair of the zoning board of appeals. Um, and then they would be called into action if there were an appeal of um, of the building commissioner's decision. And, you know, I think the board pointed out, well, we should have a charge. And um, so we uh, put one together. But it, um, so it's for a first look at it for you comments and feedback. We'd appreciate it. So on your desk tonight, you can see my incredibly clear edits. I know that they are just so, so very clear. But basically, they're the, it's a couple of issues. One is that this is not based on one of our more recent and ad accurate um, formats of a charge. So that's why a bunch of stuff is missing from the top. For example, SME status, special municipal employee status is missing. That's a separate topic and something we should plan to either vote on tonight or vote on at a future meeting because obviously all three of these, it needs special municipal employee status because these people represent at other bodies because that's their job is to represent at other bodies. So just to put the icing on the cake, it seems like we need the SME status, but of course that's supposed to be at the top of the charge also. Um, it's also supposed to indicate, and honestly, it's been a while since I looked at the more recent one that I worked on, which is um, time limited or ongoing. And in this case, it would be ongoing, whereas we've had a number of things that have been task forces lately that are time limited, you know, do a certain project like dog park that we'll talk about later and then be done rather than an ongoing committee. And another area is associated with enabled under town bylaw is not the terminology we use, but it should say town bylaw and it should say yes and it should say the actual town bylaw, which is written there. And I believe maybe member appointments was trying to get it term length. And I think in this case, we're just in the unusual case of because we picked chairs when we had this last conversation informally, it's completely different than anything else we normally do unless we looked back at like what the JCPC charge says, for example, where they appoint their own. So that's not as important. Um, but just in terms of trying to get that mask accurate in terms of the frame. Um, then in terms of the rewrite that I did there at the bottom, which I know my handwriting is atrocious, um, what I was trying to get at is that it's my understanding that there, this board only has one purpose. It's not a primary function, it's an only function. And its only function is to be called into action if an appeal is filed within 14 days of the code official's decision to suspend the residential rental permit. Now, in order to do that job, I wrote this, I totally made this section up so you guys can rip it as ever you want, but it said, the RIB will develop, and from time to time, review and revise the following. 
the criteria for evaluating appeals, the procedures, rules, and or regulations for advertising duly noticed public hearings, conduct of the duly noticed public hearing, as some of you recall, we have not had a lot of experience with some kinds of public hearings we do, unlike, say, the Planning Board, Historical Commission, or Conservation Commission, and documentation of the written decision. So that's not like an ongoing thing. It is and it isn't, and in that, their job is to do the appeal, but at some point they're going to need to get together and do those things to support them being able to do the appeal. So that's what I was trying to get at when I rewrote that, rather than making it seem like all those things are equal, because those things are not all equal. There's really only one thing that's critical for them to do. Let's just, but hopefully we've set them up for success by giving them time to make those previous arrangements. And, you know, we've waited since 2013 to put this into effect, and so we may continue to get lucky and not need to have that planning meeting because we all have a bazillion other things on our plates. But at least it is listed here, and I thank you for the structure that you gave us in terms of it being listed here, what things you would want to go ahead and address before you had to deal with that first appeal. So thank you. Ms. Kruger. Well, after that rewrite, my thing is really minor. So, um, in my universe, the bylaw is not, it's never hyphenated. So, kill that. Um, because it's inconsistent, everyone does it differently, but I, you've basically changed that anyway, but when we do a rewrite, um, the next version, up in the upper right corner, and enabled under mm. town bylaw, take it, please remove the hyphen, because it was, um, my only other thing that's that's kind of different um, when Ms. Pru, when you say um, documentation of the written decision, would that be a written decision that's then filed with a town clerk? How would somebody find that written decision? That's an excellent question that I don't believe the bylaw actually covers, and I don't know if we have practice of other communities to look to because this is a fairly interesting thing that Amherst does that others perhaps do not. So yes, unlike say Conservation Commission, Historical Commission, what would that? We could potentially add that to this because I think that's, you know, instead of trying to find it in someone's files 10 years from now, that's the place to file the written decision. So it says documentation of the written decision, but if you want to mandate rather than letting the three people develop where it's going to be, then that would be well, I, the way I to just do added, it. you know, and filed with the town clerk. So if, if you give us uh, the leeway to take this back and make the changes, I don't think there's any urgency to it, but we'll have the building commissioner look at this and review it with the town clerk as well and bring it back to you at a future meeting. It's great. That sounds good. And when you bring it back to us, if you would just make sure there's also a motion about SME status so we don't forget and have to make it up on the fly. That'd be great. Any other further comment on, on the... And what about a date on the charge so we know? What version and then it would show voted at the bottom. Oh, at the, the bottom when we're done. In the theory, when, okay. when we vote, it would show we, we voted and okay. would also show a separate date for the SME status. But you're right, that should be part of the word template is the one I've been looking for. Thank you. That's what it, where it needs to be, you're right. So if there's not further comment offered for that, then I think we'll move on to our next Agenda on which the municipal property uses and disposition process policy. We have a memo for it. Mr. Zomek, if you'd like to take us through that. Hello again. Um, well, in short, what you have before you really is very similar. Um, essentially, what I did is I took out all the um, old boilerplate, if you will, out of an earlier document that we discussed back in November. We've had two discussions on this um, to date, and this would be our third uh, conversation. And what I did was try to take out all of the references, of course, to other cities, other towns with municipal uh, real property policies, and try to boil it down to really uh, what could amount to a draft policy. And um, I'm happy to work with you tonight, get some more feedback on it. I did just want to tell you what I have been doing in the meantime since last we met on this. Um, uh, we've met, as I said, twice on this topic, uh, had, uh, had it on the select board agenda. Um, I've met with all the department heads 
at least once, some of them two or three times for feedback on this. Um, we've begun gathering data on uh, municipally owned property um, in our database. Um, I've met with the Conservation Commission to get feedback from them. They are very supportive of a process and a policy coming forth. Uh, I have also met multiple times with, uh, I've not met with the entire Affordable Housing Trust, but I've met multiple times with John Hornick, the chair, um, and at least twice with Rita Farrell, their uh, staff consultant, on this topic, um, and gotten some feedback from the, through the chair, from the trust, and they appear to be very supportive of moving this uh, process forward. Um, there's probably a little asterisk on that in that they are considering, as the chair knows, um, the East Street School and, and a possible alternative to that property going through this policy, but we'll save that for another night. And then I know Chris Prestrup, the planning director, um, has also discussed this with the planning board. I did not go to that meeting myself, but I know the planning board is aware of this, and uh, Christine did not receive any significant negative feedback on getting started with the process. As I look at this, I think of this um, as something we, to some degree, need to start, and we will have some test cases, if you will, come through the process, and I think we're gonna learn. We've never, did, uh, my understanding is we've never had a, a, a policy or process like this. At least I've been with the town for 13, 14 years. We've not done it. I think we're gonna learn as we go, and I suspect that I and the town manager will be back before you as we learn how to do this, and there will be some policy adjustments. My goal would be to start and uh, begin the process and, and start to do some of the research, get the database uh, going, and, and again, as I said before at an earlier meeting, we expect um, there's fewer than a dozen properties that we think will come through this pro uh, process, and we might start with four or five. So I'll stop there. Let's take over first. Ms. Brewer? If I could just say briefly, thank you so much for all you did to get us to this point, because we really appreciated the way that you've outlined it for us up to this point. You know, this is how this town's doing it, this is how this place is doing it, and then we knew that eventually we would need a thing that was an actual policy. So thank you for bringing us to this, to this stretch without just jumping into this in the first place. And I appreciate the <coughs> reordering at the end associated with um, I had felt like even though we all knew what it meant, it was confusing in terms of tracking, you know, whether or not it had to, it was up to the select board to take it to town meeting. And then if the select board said, no, it wasn't going to go to town meeting, that, that the only way it could actually finally be done is if it went through town meeting. The part that the select board could waive wasn't the taking it to town meeting part. Right. <laughs> they could only waive some other aspects of it. So we just want to make super clear to people that it would have to go to town meeting if it was going to actually be acted upon. And the I, I would hope, without getting into the conversation you alluded to, that the trust would understand that they could fit anything, conversation about the East Street School, potentially under number 10. Because if we don't put East Street School through this process as a test case, I'm not sure why we're bothering to do this at all. I mean, East Street School is the main reason we needed this policy after all these years of discussing different variations. So I would think that item 10 about waiving and varying would accommodate any creative things they want to do associated with that, but I don't, I don't know why we would exempt, give them any impression that we were exempting any discussion of East Street School from this policy, I would hope that they would be, if, if, if anything, the first test case, I can already hear people talking about a performing arts center at the fire station mm -hmm. that's still occupied as being another <laughs> test case, still occupied being the critical point, um, but thank you. So I will paint a little bit of the picture about East Street School later when I get my member report, but anyway. Okay, um, okay I, if you could bear with me, I had a couple of questions and comments and, um, I am pleased to see it. It's it's been coming. This process has been coming along. I don't. I think the East Street School conversation has underscored the need to do this. I don't think it's the reason we're doing it. I think it's been long awaited and uh, important. Um, it's particularly interested in the um, where this clarifies in the second paragraph. Uh, 
the beginning of the document about the authorization to dispose surplus real property. And it also, uh, and I did have some questions about how this would relate to our municipal affordable housing trust, but partway, so all town-owned property, I kind of underlined all in the first sentence of that paragraph, and then town meeting, partway down, town meeting must also change the use of the property and or transfer the custody of the property, and then it gives the citation, Mass General Law, Chapter 40, 15A. Um, so one question I had, and I'm going to, I'll go through all of mine, but if you could just kind of follow. Um, if we're looking at, for example, the East Street School and the trust wanted to have the custody transferred to them, um, it sounds like that would require a town meeting action, some question about that. And then uh, the next sentence goes on if the property is being transferred and then it says the board needs to make a determination before or after town meeting and i was just confused before or after town meeting um Time. looks like it's kind of hanging out there maybe it's it's just grammatical um that it does not need the property for the purposes which it was held um so um, I'm glad we clarified about the value could be by the assessor, but is best practice is by an appraiser. That's in here, and I thought that was good. Um, page two under the section, policy and process for disposing of surplus real property. I was thinking because of that issue about the transfer of the care and custody, or transfer of the custody, maybe we want to also add a number in here about a policy to determine when and how, what, what the criteria would be to transfer the custody. Because it doesn't, it doesn't really talk about that, it just talks about disposition. But sometimes, there, there's, there's often a first step where one department or board has it and it's going to another, how do we decide when it's ripe to be transferred? I'm almost done. Um, Under five advisory groups recommendation to the town manager shall include B, the assessed and appraised value. I think it's supposed to be and or the appraised value. 5B. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. then um, this is um, six. G, you have um, about the restrictions can be placed, making recommendations about the restrictions. And I had a question mark if G might best be under five or both in five and six, which is where the advisory group makes recommendations about what restrictions might be placed on the property before it gets used for whatever or goes into this surplus process. So uh, I don't have an answer, maybe in both. Um, and then 6D. Assessing, making recommendations on the impact of sale and proposed use of the property on the abutting landowners and surrounding neighborhood. My, how are you going to do that? That to me is uh, a little bit of a landmine unless you know what that means. Um, the only last one I have is under next steps. My final comment, the third bullet develop a corresponding policy that would establish the priorities for determining a property as surplus? Question mark, I don't get corresponding policy. Develop a corresponding policy separate from this, as part of this, I just, just you know, this is a draft, so that's, that's just, as a reader, I, I struggled with some of that. Yeah, I thought that last bullet might come up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we might soften that a little bit, but my understanding in talking to staff about that was that, and town council, was that we, as a, as a town, we should, it reminds me a little bit of, of the CPAC developing kind of some priorities. In other words, we would gather from CPAC, from the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, from CONCOM, not new information, but we would pull together um, a short um, policy might be too strong, but a guiding document to say, 
you know, in 2018, uh, the town of Amherst has established um, strong and clear goals on the need for affordable housing, as referenced in the Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Plan X. The master plan speaks to this, so that we would have something that we're not, every property is not, uh, we're not looking at it simply in a, oh, well, this might be good for conservation, this might be good for, no, these are the guiding principles, if you will, that we're using to say, and, and a good example would be the need for affordable, uh, affordable housing. Whereas we've been redefining, if you will, and, and refocusing our goals for open space in the last five to 10 years. Those are different than they were in the 1980s. So I think that document needs to be living, a living document that isn't, it's, it's appropriate for 2018, 19, maybe a five year mm -hmm. period. Yeah. So, so that, that's okay. what I was trying to get at. I could just thought, um, that helps. I just would suggest just in terms of word crafting that you might spend some more time re just sure. refining and exp not as long as maybe your answer to me verbally, but trying to get that into sure. that, that section. Um, we can do that. Other questions or comments? I was just going to recommend something more along the lines of criteria mm -hmm. for that last concept because in some ways it's also analogous to the community development strategy that Block Grant uses, right? Every year they look and they right. say, based on all the different policy documents we have in town, these are our priorities for this year. Yeah. So it's a strategy, it's a set of criteria, but so as not to confuse it with being a different policy than this policy. Right. And if I could, just to address one other question that Ms. Kruger brought up, the, the issue of care, custody, and control. What we're learning from council is that um, absolutely there are different ways that a town can work with a municipal affordable housing trust, and there are many examples in Massachusetts. And in fact, um, uh, through town meeting, um, n the entire property does not need to be transferred all at once. Uh, through deed, in other words, um, there are ways that the trust could have certain rights to explore development for A, B, or C while not taking full custody of the property. The town may still take care of the building, you know, keep it secure, et cetera, et cetera, and then eventually if a viable option is determined for housing, then uh, a transfer could, could take place. I just a quick follow-up on that. So. My understanding, I think, reinforced by this document is, for example, if the East Street School were to go to the Municipal Trust for their exploration period, for their custody, that would require a vote of town meeting for the transfer of custody, and then later, or maybe simultaneous, a vote of town meeting to um, authorize the disposition for sale or lease for affordable housing. That's, that's my understanding as well, that it could take place in two votes or one vote, depending on what the trust wanted and what they asked the town to do. The other- It would have to address those two issues. Yes. Those both would have to be spelled out in the vote, custody and eventual dis disposition. Or yes. There's gonna need to be a, a vote even before that because in our research, um, we don't appear to have a vote from the school committee, so we're gonna need a, a vote from the school committee, essentially uh, giving back mm -hmm. the school to the town to make clear that it is under the town's control. And that's a town meeting vote, so that's three. Uh, that's just a school committee the vote. The school committee vote yes. on record, and then the two Correct. are simultaneous to. Correct. So again, I, I, I think we're going to learn as we go here a little bit. I, I think this provides a framework. I'm happy to um, make a few um, edits here, and then I, I may not need to come back before you, but certainly through the town manager, we could get this approved at a future date, whatever you'd like. Ms. Brewer. I was just going to mention that when, when you're editing, so page four, I think, is when we ended up talking more about the corresponding policy and the potential words, criteria, and strategy, and the way you had explained that. Um, that is, of course, also then talked about on page two under item three. 
So just so that you know it's in both places. Mm. Recognize that it's in both places that we're trying to avoid that particular use of policy in, in, in that section because this is the policy. That's something else. Excellent, thank you. Other comment or question for Great. Mr. Zomek on this item? Thank you for this. I will. Um, I, I do have one question. Have you mentioned to Mr. Hornick about the school committee needing to take action? He's very, very aware of that. Okay. So that's good. So I won't, I won't steal my own thunder from a later conversation about things that happened at the trust meeting last week. But anyway, um, so if there's not further questions or comments on this, um, thank you for that. And why don't we move into um, 4F, which is project updates on a variety of things. I wonder if I could ask the chair, would it be possible since Ms. Ceccarello is here to do the sustainability committee first? Would that Absolutely, be? if that's all right with the rest of the, the body. I presume it is, so yes, that's, that's fine with me. So we'll go to the recommendation for creation of a sustainability committee. Do you wanna start this? I and do, then yes. Turn? Okay, thank you. So, thank you. Uh, for many, for, well, since I've been here, and it's not very long, but you've had it on my goal list from the very beginning that you wanted the town to continue its focus on sustainable um, issues and sustainability initiatives. And um, as we've thought about this, we've um, I want to first recognize the amount of work that we've already done, uh, and I've tried to document some of these things. And Ms. Ciccarello came up with a, a list that's, a page long of all the things that we have done over the over the years what this doesn't include is all the work that we've done at, at wastewater treatment plant the water treatment plant a number of other um, departments these are sort of things that have happened uh, in general for the town so we've done a lot and that's the message here um, but I think we can do more and I think that um, the expectation that you have set is that you expect us to do, do more and so we're prepared to do that, and I think we're set to, set up to, to do that. So as we've conceptualized this, um, one of the things was there are, you can do a hundred things. There's a, a thousand things, it's so big. Sustainable stuff goes from you know the way you build a building, the way you um, source the materials to electric vehicles, to um, lights, to um, how we um, provide uh, water to at events and it can be a million things and sometimes there are so many things that we get we struggle with inaction so I think what we sort of need is a overarching group that's going to first establish goals for us on what we're trying to achieve and then from that group there will um, emerge um, smaller groups that would not be necessarily part of the larger group but would be part of the overall strategy um, to focus specifically on, so zero energy buildings or um, you know aggregation, aggregating electricity in the town or um, working on solid waste issues. And I, I guess tonight, what I was gave you a brief memo to sort of get you start thinking about it and how you want to conceptualize it. This is one person's basically concept, you know, idea on one way to go. It may not be the best. Um, and um, and so it's just a, a way to sort of open up the dialogue a little bit. Uh, we have Ms. Ciccarello here who's been working in the field for a long, long time, and she's able to contribute or weigh in as well. I'm not sure if you have anything to add, but she's um, drafted much of this. And um, so in my mind, what's really needed is for us to establish a set of goals that we as a community want to achieve. Um, there are many models out there, other communities that have done a really good job on this. Uh, City of Cambridge, obviously, but a number of, of communities are um, out in front on this issue, and I think we expect ourselves to be one of the leaders in this area, at least the leaders in Western Massachusetts. And I think that we're not far off from being that way, but we need an organized um, and um, set of goals that we want to, to reach for and then a strategy for, re for meeting those goals. Um, otherwise, what I fear is that there will be um, initiative overload. People, individuals will come with individual projects. They th and every individual project will have merit, will think, and it'll be unrealistic or, or unreasonable for us to say no to any particular thing 
unless we have a criteria. And what's really important for us, and especially for our staff, is to say, what can I say no to? What can I say yes to? Does it fit in with an overall policy and where we want to put our, our best efforts? And um, so I think that's why we need some uh, a group of people, volunteers from the community, who are going to help us conceptualize this. And the great thing about this is we've got some really, really talented people in the community who are already thinking along these lines. And we have our institutional partners who are active uh, in addressing these issues on their own campuses, um, Hampshire and Amherst and UMass, and we can learn from the efforts that they have made and, in fact, fold them into our efforts because I think we should be looking at this as a community-wide initiative, not just town buildings or things. We may want to start with a few things that are town-oriented, but ultimately we're looking at ourselves as a, as a whole community. That includes these three institutions, and I think there's a lot of cross-fertilization that can happen. So that's the sort of concept of this, and be really eager to hear. I don't know if either of you want to add into anything, but uh, eager to hear some thoughts on this and what, what we should do next. Thank you, Stephanie Ciccarello, Sustainability Coordinator for the town. And I would say that um, Amherst has been um, in this role and doing this work for quite some time, as noted by Mr. Balkerman. And we are actually, in many other communities, noticed and recognized as a community that's doing quite a bit in the field of sustainability and energy efficiency and dealing with the issue of climate change because we have been doing this for so long. But we are at a point where a lot of our focus has been really at the municipal building level and just on what the town operations are doing to address this issue. And we're at a point where we really do need to sort of make it a, a broader, more holistic, town-wide effort. Um, and that is really what other communities that we have been working very closely with, for instance, North, the city of Northampton, the city of Greenfield, um, some other communities in the area, are now looking really more more holistically at their entire and broader community. So that's really the point that we're at um, and why we need input from not just the town government portion of you know what's happening with the town buildings and town operations, but we need to look at what's happening within our broader community and so we need representation from the community as well. And we need a, a lens, we need to sort of look at sustainability and all the work that we do in the community from that lens of how it impacts the long range um, vision and sustainability of our community as a whole. So that's really what this committee would really be charged with. Questions or comments for the, yeah. Mr. Steinberg? Well, um, I do note that we uh, had a very successful um, enterprise to reach out to make a difference for homes within our community with Solarize Amherst. And that was an extraordinary success. Um, so I think that we uh, really have done quite a bit and I'm pleased that we're gonna continue to look to doing more. The question that I was pondering was um, how much of the various projects that we've been working on have been driven by staff and how much have been driven by volunteers and are we looking to the committee to be the core of the volunteers to do the work or are we looking for the committee as Mr. Balkerman said um, to set the goals and um, the recruitment of volunteers is a separate enterprise and the reason I bring that up is that the recycling and refuse management committee very much is um, not just establishing goals, but actually um, organizing itself to do the grunt work to achieve the goals. And um, I, I guess I'd uh, just look for clarity as we move forward so that we um, are um, sure that we are charging the committee appropriately for the role. And if we are not going to have the committee moving forward, um, taking the volun citizen volunteer component of implementation that we know how that's organized and placed. 
So, so if, if it's okay, Mr. Chair, I think there's a dialogue because I don't I don't have answers and Stephanie, had, but it's, we have opinions, and so that's the type of thing our response. My sense is that we do need volunteers to do the work, and that's where the core of the work will begin. I think we do need a volunteer group that is educated on this areas or on these areas already to help us um, work out a, a, an overall plan. But I think there will be subgroups. You know, I think of the dog park task force, for instance, that they have an overall group, but they have small groups that go off and work on their own on location and rules and things like that. We, you know, it'd, it'd be that type of thing that we would have subgroups that would be going out and working on, say, energy aggregation or whatever it is that we we really want. Transportation might be one. Yeah, I would just add that um, it's really going to vary. There will be moments and projects and times when uh, there will be a requirement for staff to sort of make a commitment to maybe maybe um, either move us towards a campaign or project, for instance, with Solarize. I had a very large role in the beginning in terms of the application process, but when it came time to actually then implement the program, we had a group of community volunteers who were our Solarize team, and they were the ones who actually went out and did the hard work of the marketing. They were you know, they were at events, they were going door to door, they, they had a lot of different projects and campaigns that they created to advertise the the opportunity for folks to install solar on their homes during that time frame. So it was a very specific targeted campaign. It was a very specific and targeted time frame as well. So I think it, you know, it depends. There's, again, there's a lot of opportunity here, but, um, and again, it's not, a, it's not something I could answer today either because we really, that's kind of what we need the committee for is to help us frame what the priorities would be moving forward as well. So I'm going to jump in at this moment. I, I think for me, when I think about this, I, I think about um, we may want to consider in, in regard to, you know, sort of developing a, a group like this is in some aspects of, of what we do, there are certain uh, of our committees and boards that have certain professional expertise required. It's like the Board of Health has, you know, certain requirements. Um, design review, you have to have like an architect there. That might be a wise thing to put in here. And the mm -hmm. reason why I say that is because I think the most, um, maybe not the most, but one of the critical things that when you're setting the goals are things that have highest leverage. And it depends on the area of, of sustainability you're looking at as to what might be a high leverage thing. As you said, you know, any idea that people bring forward is noble and, 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 and worthwhile, but is it the best at this point? Is it the kind of thing that moves us the most in whatever directions we choose? And so I think we need to you know, identify what those areas are that we think uh, are most important to us or define what the, the broad categories are. And then within those categories, what are the highest leverage sort of things? And I think people that have expertise in um, in, in those areas will be valuable in sort of framing the conversation because you can get into things that are, you know, very good and noble and have an impact, but their impact for the effort is small relative to other things we could do. And we want to probably take on those things that have the largest impact first, I think. Um, there may be varying opinions about that. And, and obviously, you know, a lot of it is opinion based as far as what is mm -hmm. important or what has the highest leverage or that sort of thing. But I think that's something that I would offer as a suggestion as we move forward in this is to think about what expertise do we want to bring on. We have some in-house, obviously, you know, uh, yourself included in that. But, but, um, but I think there's plenty in our community. We have the you know, fortunate nature of having, you know, a university and, and two colleges in, the, in city limits that think about these things, um, you know, professionally all day long. So, you know, we should tap into that as best we can um, and, and help that to help people with good intentions and lots of energy to keep them focused on things that have the highest leverage would be my suggestion. Um, a couple things, so just to reinforce what my colleagues have been saying. Uh, Mr. Steinberg's question and then Mr. Buckman's answer about policy versus implementation, I think is almost a broader conversation because it comes up often with other committees in the work. Like, when is the committee there for policy and when are they expected to roll up their sleeves and do the work? So. Um, there's different ways to look at that. Um, I think your point about the professional, looking at some professional skill set, not for every, every, 
everything, what I worry about, I mean, I think we're going to move ahead and create this entity. And right now we're just kind of, you know, fleshing out some ideas and different thoughts we've had. So this, I'm assuming we're going forward. Um, but some of the, um, I worry that from, I worry that sometimes depending on the composition of the group or maybe the charge, um, you get people are advocating for their interest area or the thing they're most passionate about. I think we do have to be able to prioritize because we, we're not going to, resources and time are finite and so we have to make choices all the time and um, I wouldn't want to see, well, these two people want to do building stuff and these two people want to do trash and these, and then you sort of cancel each other out. But um, people who can, um, who are excited about the overview you know, and the set of compromises that have to be made in order to move the, the town as a whole forward, you know, the picking and choosing kind of thing that you were talking about, um, that that problem interests them and not just, you know, whatever. The, I mean, advocacy is great and being passionate is great, but I, I, I don't want this to splinter out into one of these and one of those um, kind, of, kind of things, because um, I want this to really help us have a clear vision of where we're, where we're going. Um, so, I'm not sure if it's exactly along those lines, but I like to hope so. And so, um, one of the things I would like that I really like about this is all the things we've talked about, but also the idea of, of bringing all these different groups who have been working on things individually and in, in set little areas before, like as, as is mentioned on Ms. Ciccarello's list, we had the Energy Conservation Task Force in 2000 for some number of years, and then it just kind of dwindled away because we have other things to do and other priorities. But the work that group did would be entirely appropriate under this umbrella. And looking at this umbrella, um, so you know how you structure it, what you call it, certainly UTAC that you know I've been part of likes to argue about what's an executive committee and what's a subcommittee and what's a steering committee. No offense to Mr. Somek, who's doing a fantastic <laughs> job over there. It's just you know the way people structure things in their minds and what that means. But you know, we previously had work on climate action by Ms. Chicarello with also some volunteers in, involved, but it wasn't really a, f a formal town committee in some respects, and some things were and some things weren't. And I would definitely like to see recycling and refuse management be considered for moving under this umbrella. Mm -hmm. So again, you'd have, so that you don't just have you know, one of these and one of these and one of these. It's kind of like you have this overall group, and then when it's decided to move on with certain things, then a whole other committee can get picked that may have one or two people with expertise, and then a whole bunch of just really dedicated people who want to do it. Um, so that you have all those branches off the committee, but so that they all know what each other is working on, and whether it's you know bringing us another thing about how we have to buy recycled paper towels or whatever it is, it's not just tell procurement to do that, but that everybody knows that that's all part of the bigger picture. So, you know, not setting it up in parallel with recycling and refuse, but with the idea that recycling and refuse would fit nicely within this because the work they're already doing, um, it makes a lot of sense to me to look at this as a sustainability effort and figure out what all goes in that. So that, as you say, you can make the hard decisions about what to pursue quickly and what to maybe put off for a little while. Well, along the same lines, I like the way the town manager presented it because it, it reminds me a little bit of the master plan. You know, when you've got something, you can say, is it in conformity with this overall set of goals? And then it's much easier for the employees because there is a lot of pressure on staff to do things. And we have very active citizens with lots of ideas. So I think that's a good way to frame it, maybe. The other thing I would mention, if I could, um, just talking about this is as we move ahead and depending on the circumstances and situation, I think we. I'm not sure how to sort of articulate this without being sort of overly dictating the direction, but, but uh, the idea of impact, so when we want to broaden to the larger community, now you're starting to impose things upon the citizenry, whether it be our business community, our homeowners, what's the impact of that and how to evaluate that well as we move ahead? Because, you know, you can create, um, you know, zoning that forces certain <coughs> kinds of things to happen, you can have unintended consequences along with the intended consequences that price people out of our 
you know, it, it could run counter to, you know, other efforts we're trying to make in affordable housing, perhaps, or uh, we might squeeze businesses out because these kinds of changes are uh, onerous and, you know, it's just not something that people have a way to, you know, may or may not be able to evaluate, be able to evaluate well. Um, and so that's, you know, again, gets back to some of the expertise question that I raised earlier, but also just I think that's a, that's a piece of the puzzle as well as, as, as we make these, you know, uh, movements in these different areas that we keep and we try to broaden it out, you know, what constraints are we imposing upon other people and what is the impact of those, of those things as we move ahead? So does it change the timelines we work under or does it change the degree to which we do things? Uh, and do we put then, a, you know, reevaluation points in, in those sort of actions and, and activities? So I just wanted to address a few things that were said. Um, I guess, first of all, I just want to say in terms of the, um, the, um, the Energy Task Force, that when they came together, they really had a specific goal, which was to create a climate action plan, which was done. And, and it was actually disbanded after the climate action plan was completed and we were getting into the phase of implementation. And what happened was once we sort of got into that phase of implementation, um, the sort of necessity of having that organized group wasn't um, necessary quite as much anymore. And also we were moving towards the direction of um, become a green community. At that point, green communities became available, and there was really a shift in the focus of looking at this issue. I think because, um, you know, there's been a movement at the federal level to move away from being involved in, for instance, um, the Paris Accord that I think we're looking more now at specifically addressing climate change again. That's kind of a, it seems to be a renewed focus and not just talking about energy efficiency, but really looking at climate change once again. So I think having a, having a group focused on this effort absolutely at the more, the broader community level is important and I hear your concerns and I, I um, share them that we don't want to be imposing things on the citizenry in town in a way that would feel onerous to them. I mean, this is something that hopefully there will be um, broader support within the community and something the community will, will want and want to work towards and be part of. Um, in doing that, I think what we really need is to have some kind of a plan. And my hope would be that when we gather a, com a committee together, that we create some kind of a plan and a framework to move forward with this work, because you really can be over the map. And as Ms. Kruger pointed, you have people with their specific interests. So in order to make that sort of a more equitable playing field, I think we need to have some kind of a plan or strategy that we create as a committee to move forward. And so that will sort of keep that in check to some degree. And it will also identify what those priorities are. And by all means, absolutely, we have an incredible pool of talent within this community. And absolutely, we should tap into them. And there are several people, I think, that would be very eager to participate in this effort already. To further comment or questions for the manager or staff on this? Just because I, I can't resist um, <laughs> in a small edit on the first line mm -hmm. when it says re regarding in it, it, it says an Amherst that is resilient and sustainable. I thought the title for what we're doing is a resilient and sustainable Amherst. We get rid of the that is, and I'm offering that. You can keep it the way you have so it. Or it <laughs> it's interesting because as Stephanie pointed out the sustainable Amherst is already is that that is labeled the Amherst College initiatives. Sustaining Amherst is our the town bill. So there there's these words are so you, we'd want something that sort of recognizes that who we are. So sustaining the Amherst was the one that we've used as a town. But if you, if you, so like, they don't say college after theirs. No. Nope. Well, then let's just take theirs and make them add the word college. <laughs> they, they have the uh, they have the Twitter account. They can oh. pay us for the privilege. <laughs> um, okay. It's all about the Twitter, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you both very much, Ms. Brewer. Did you have something else to When when you write the charge, that I'm sure we're going to suggest you please go ahead and do, is there is surely some reference you can make to the master plan. Mm -hmm. There. It's in there. It does say it does have it referenced someplace. Yeah. It talks about 
but the charge oh, no. itself should reference mm -hmm. the master plan. Maybe that was the disposition of property one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're Never doing mind. so much planning. The other one. That's right. So thank you all very much. So, so next steps um, would be we will work on this, uh, a charge, a sort of steps going forward to sort of lay out a map on where this might go and bring that back to you for further con conversation. Right. Oh, just the last, I was glad to see that the pl your concept includes folding in the recycling and refuse because I was looking at this saying we really need this, but I have a sort of my... Um, no net gain of committees, so this right. would actually accomplish the no net gain. Net gain. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So now we'll go back to 4F, which involves project updates on a variety of topics. 4F. Yeah. That's, that's, right. that's right. That's right. So if you great, thank you. And again, I will respect your time and the the time this evening. I know you have many more agenda items. Um, but um, the town manager asked me to uh, give you and the, the, the public out there a very quick um, overview of some of the exciting projects that uh, we have on the, on the front burner. And it is going to be a pretty exciting winter and spring and summer construction season, we hope. I wanted to talk very briefly, and I'm going to go pretty quickly. I'm happy to maybe go back at the end, and if you have any questions, um, just note them and we can, we can zip back through. Um, but I have five projects and then one minor uh, update that I think the manager may want to give on Sweetser Park. I have a slide on Sweetser. Um, but let me start with um, uh, where we're headed on Community Field. Um, as you know, uh, the Rec Working Group um, is um, currently uh, focused on creating a master plan for the area you see before you on the screen, Community Field, the high school, and the middle school. Um, these areas have been identified really as our core recreational uh, field facilities uh, in town. And uh, we are looking, uh, we have hired uh, using CPA funds, Weston and Sampson, an engineering and design firm out of Boston with extensive experience in master planning for recreational facilities. We're very excited to be working with them. They came out uh, in December and January to do, uh, before it snowed actually, and then after as well, to do some um, recon and some baseline um, uh, research out here in town. They met with the rec working group. They met with the AD. Uh, they met uh, with um, facility staff and, and my staff, and they are beginning to put together uh, this master plan for this core area that you see, uh, that you see before you on the, on the screen. Um, we are planning a, a public meeting on this topic for February 28th at 7 p.m. That will, uh, an announcement of that will be going out uh, very soon uh, in the next day or two. It'll be at 7 p.m. in the town room hosted by the rec working group. And the idea there is for us to gather input from coaches, um, from parents, from athletes, uh, about the current conditions, the configuration, um, ideas, concepts, uh, hopes, dreams about what uh, these fields and facilities could be. We, uh, you'll note that community field not only includes the football field, it's really a complex of football, softball, baseball, and the War Memorial Pool. So they will be looking at that facility as well. You know that there is a very old playground associated with War Memorial Pool that clearly needs work. Um, they'll be looking, of course, uh, at the track and the soccer field. We know through uh, our communication with uh, school uh, personnel that the track is in, in dire need of, of, of some improvement. So we have uh, town and school staff as well as committee and board members on the rec working group. We're going to be pulling in Mr. Um, McPherson, our new facilities director as well, and uh, I'm slated to meet with him in the next week or so to kind of update him on this. So I think I'll keep moving and then we can come back as need be. Um, this was referenced earlier in the evening, another very exciting project, and that is uh, being put forth by the Dog Park Task Force. After some um, many months of exploring both public and private land in town, uh, the committee, with a recommendation from me, 
we have landed on uh, trying to utilize, exploring the utilization of a small piece of the south landfill um, identified up in the right-hand corner there um, off of Old Belchertown Road. We really need about an acre and a half, maybe two acres of the old, or we're trying to call it the south landfill because old and new confuses folks. Um, we have, uh, working with the chair and the various members, we have made uh, presentations to uh, a number of boards and committees in town. And we recently, uh, as recently as last week, um, got a recommendation from CPAC for $90,000 to recommend to town meeting to spend to explore the, the full feasibility of putting the dog park on the uh, south landfill. That would include surveying, permitting work, engineering work. As you can imagine, um, this is not the easiest piece of property, but it is town owned. Um, there are very few encumbrances on it, uh, but we do have to explore and work with DEP on assessing its uh, appropriateness and uh, some of the uh, potential impacts, of course, to the cap. The cap is the most important thing, if you will, in keeping that landfill secure uh, for generations to come. So we'll be working with DEP. Um, Berkshire Design Group has volunteered to do a um, uh, in kind a concept for the dog park. Uh, Peter Wells, who lives in Amherst and uh, has his <coughs> firm has uh, designed a number of dog parks in the region. And our hope is to put that design with a grant application to the Stanton Foundation. The Stanton Foundation uh, has offices in New York and Boston, and they are the lead funder of dog parks uh, in Massachusetts. And uh, I believe uh, we can secure a grant up to $225,000 for the construction of a dog park. So we're in the feasibility stage. We'll be working with DEP. This will have to dovetail, if you will. I'll be talking about solar in a minute, but we will have to work very closely with uh, our team, uh, Mr. Mooring. Um, I've been consulting with Mr. Mooring, Ms. Ciccarello on this, but we'll have to be working very closely with our solar team on this because we know we need the majority of the South landfill, which is up on the screen, um, as mitigation for our solar project on the North landfill. So again, um, we're creating, excuse me, the Dog Park Task Force has much of their information already up on the town website, and we'll be adding to that as we go. So the next step would be uh, a concept design done by Berkshire Design, and then the Stanton Foundation grant. So very exciting to be moving that forward. Uh, the next project is um, what we call the North Common Main Street Parking, a com a now a combined project. As the select board knows, um, we do have funds available um, through um, town meeting CPAC funds to um, design improvements to the North Common, uh, the area between Spring Street and what we call the Main Street parking lot. In consultation with Mr. Bockelman, uh, with Mr. Mooring, um, we decided that it made a lot of sense to do, if, uh, if we knew we were gonna redo the Main Street parking lot, we had already had funds for um, the North Common, it really made sense to treat this entire area as one and design the improvements both for parking, for pedestrian, ADA, plazas, uh, lighting, uh, uh, erosion control, all of that as one. Um, so at this, at this time, our plan is to utilize, um, um, Mr. Bachelman may help me out here, but uh, transportation fund money, um, as well as the CPAC allocation of $540,000. Um, we are currently negotiating with Weston and Sampson uh, on this project, um, and we hope to have them um, under contract uh, very soon. Um, this will be a project that is um, overseen, if you will, the public forums by the LSSE Commission, the Historical Commission, uh, with staff support, of course, from the various uh, departments. Uh, of course, uh, DPW, Mr. Mooring, and his engineering team will be uh, right there every step of the way. Um, we're planning public meetings on this in late February. I don't have exact dates yet, um, but I will have those soon. 
We will also be um, creating a web page, its own web page for this project so that the public can keep up on it as we move forward. You may recall um, as we were assembling the money for the North Common, we had a number of public meetings. So we feel as though we're not really starting back at zero here. Um, this conceptual design was done uh, by DPW engineering staff, um, and we feel as though we're gonna build on that concept design, but we really don't wanna go back to square one on this. We've spent a considerable amount of time and energy. Uh, we've gotten a lot of public comment so we can build on that. So that's the North Common. Um, our goal would be under, to be under construction, ideally, um, early this summer. And that is a, uh, that is a um, optimistic and uh, aggressive goal. Moving forward, uh, more excitement down south, uh, the Groff Park uh, Spray Park and the Groff Spray Park and Playground. Again, the select board is very familiar with this uh, project. Um, we, again, were successful at um, gaining the confidence of, of the CPAC and town meeting to uh, assemble a funding package um, just to orient folks at home, this is uh, the parking lot at Groff Park, the existing comfort station. And in this area, this is the area where there was an old playground and the old um, uh, wading pool, which has now been removed. The goal here would be to create a spray park feature, a significant spray park feature, and a playground, uh, and a pavilion both at the upper level and although it doesn't show it in this figure, a new pavilion on the lower level, which is down at the Fort River. And these are just some concept designs and, and ideas uh, that uh, we are bringing to the table. Um, uh, it, it, this is a project that is going to be designed by Berkshire Design. As it, as it turns out, they have extensive experience in, um, in uh, spray park and uh, playground development. Um, again, we are planning public meetings uh, both in town but also down in South Amherst in February and March. Uh, our goal is to be meeting with folks. Uh, we'll probably have one at Crocker Farm. Uh, we hope to have one at uh, one of the one or more of the apartment complexes off of East Hadley Road. As you know, also, we've asked through the CDBG process for funding to do a multipurpose path on East Hadley Road. We have half of that package assembled and we've put forth uh, the, the remaining funding request that'll go to the state um, in the coming weeks. So the idea is to really reach out to uh, many of the residents, neighbors, people who are within walking, biking distance of Crocker Farm, Crocker Farm parents, et cetera, um, to gain uh, insight as to what they would like to see at that park. Now LSSC has done some of that already but we're going to redouble our, our efforts to um, gather more, more input. Uh, this project will be overseen by the LSSC Commission, of course, but with input from appropriate staff, from planning, from DPW, and from LSSC. Um, again, we will have um, a unique web page up with this project in the coming days so that people can follow the progress of the, of the project. Um, our hope here, and, and uh, this is another aggressive timeline, but we're pretty confident in this one. Our hope is to have this under construction late August, or at least by September 1st. The goal is to be able to use Groff Park the entire summer, um, and then um, we would have to fence, of course, the construction area. But there would be construction equipment and, and some modest um, disruption of, of use there. But if we can get the entire spring and summer, um, that we that would be our goal. So Groff Park. And then finally, um, this is an image that we used at a recent um, solar forum that we had in this room. Some of the select board was there. We had about 40 people attend. I thought it was a very productive discussion. We had brief presentations that I, I did one, Ms. Ciccarello did one, and Mr. Mooring. Mr. Bachelman was there to answer questions as well. Um, we feel as though we have a strong and, um, and, and a growing partnership with Lee Energy Group, our partner on this. Um, for those folks at home who have not participated in this forum, this is a picture of the north landfill with the transfer station, which is right off of Belchertown Road. Um, 
And this is simply a conceptual design showing this cross-hatching represents uh, a concept of where panels for solar would go. This is about, uh, about a four megawatt uh, array. And again, that is currently under development and design. Mr. Mooring, Ms. Ciccarello have been meeting with our, our partners at Lee Energy to talk about how this uh, would, would move forward. There's a number of permitting pathways that need to uh, uh, be uh, completed by Lee Energy and, and the town will support Lee Energy as they move forward. As I alluded to earlier, this um, north landfill is all um, habitat for a very rare species of bird called the grassland um, sparrow, the grasshopper sparrow. And in order to develop solar here, we need to put uh, land um, from the south landfill in what's called a conservation restriction. So we'll be working with DEP and the folks at Natural Heritage Program in Boston on how to do that. We've had a number of uh, conversations with them and so we have a framework for how that will, um, how that will happen. So we're quite confident in moving forward with that strategy. Um, again, this project um, already has a web presence, but we'll be beefing up that web presence uh, off of the town website in the coming days. Um, the permitting pathways, there'll be many opportunities for the public to get involved. There'll be conservation commission permits. There'll be a DEP process, natural heritage process, um, MEPA process, and then um, finally there'll be a local ZBA permit that will need to be um, uh, achieved by the applicant. So there'll be plenty of time for the public to, to hear more about that. And then maybe I'll stop there. I know Mr. Bockelman wanted to have one slide up about Sweetser Park, and I'm not sure if he wanted to update the board briefly on that. Sure, it's, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So as you may have seen in the paper, uh, in, uh, Senator Rosenberg has um, put a funding request in for a bond authorization bill at the um, State House, and one of the goals would be to, for a, uh, his request would be to put in $100,000 for making improvements to Sweetser Park. We already know that um, well, you will hear in a couple weeks when we talk about our paving plan that Main Street is scheduled to be repaved. The sidewalk from um, along Sweetser Park and um, as far up uh, towards the Emily Dickinson House uh, as we can do, as we can achieve, it's a, it's a design challenge, is, um, is in very bad repair and needs to be addressed. And whether we get this grant or not, that is a top priority, one of the top priorities for the town. Um, but we appreciate the efforts of the Senator and if that money comes through, there are enormous needs throughout the town that we need to address, and this is one of them. So we utilize his the funds from the state to take take on this project. If I could could just add on this, we do have some uh, money set aside through CPAC to assess the condition and possible um, uh, repairs for the fountain in Sweetser Park, which is a historic feature of the park. Um, it is a unique. I don't have all the details myself. Um, but I know that Mr. Tucker, before he retired, schooled me extensively on on the need to look very, very closely at that, that beautiful historic fountain. So we do have funds set aside for that. We plan to contract with uh, an expert to come in and assess uh, both the condition the, uh, and the inner workings of that fountain to see how we can repair that as part of the capital needs in the future. Ms. Brewer. Um, well, that's very exciting to see possibilities for Sweetser. I'm just um, looking at this and wanted to underscore that we have the Clark House and then Ann Whalen right in this area, which are two senior housing developments in town. And whatever we do to have an eye towards the sort of age-friendly community that Mr. Bachman has talked to us about before and maybe make sure that those people also have a voice because in a way this is their front yard or their backyard, if you will. I mean, this is a highly used area. Families play here. I'd like to see, you know, a play area more, more developed. But I think anything we do around the sidewalks on either side of suites or um, and benches, whatever, that make it even more accessible and friendly 
for the seniors who, who this is their yard. Are there any questions? I know I went through those quickly, but are there, and you've heard some of that before, but are there any questions on any of the other projects that I might answer for you tonight? Ms. Brewer. It's, it's not a question. It's more part of a future presentation. So when you're talking more about Groff Park, although the neighbors who use it right now are pretty well aware of how old that equipment is, just in terms of context of there is the upper and lower playground. I mean, I know you all know all this. I'm talking about the general public. So the upper and lower playgrounds, obviously the lower playground is substantially older than the upper playground. And when you referred to the upper playground as old, I was like, well, let me think. Okay, I worked on Mill River's most recent playground. Oh, wow, almost 20 years ago. So, yeah, it is older because that was done before Mill River's current iteration, which is showing its age and needing some refreshing. But I think it's important for people to recognize that because people don't, particularly people who don't have young kids playing right now, they just remember, you know, the old stuff at Mill River that you remember from when you were a child, and your family's involvement there, and then at the lower part of Groff Park, where many of that, much of that equipment just stayed the same for generations of children, and that good enough for us. It's it was good, good enough, enough for us. <laughs> Burn your hands on that slide. It's okay. It's not that high. It'll be fine. And just just show that you know, just like splash parks are not something we ex we experienced as children that they're, they have become the, the way to go associated with water features and safety and supervision, that playground equipment has also changed a lot over the years. And so even though it doesn't feel like it's that old, it, it does need refreshing, much more memorial. Again, being newer, but not new by any stretch of the imagination. Because I think it's sometimes hard for people who don't have kids who play there right now to realize it, it, it's just not what we would want it to be for the community values that we hold. It's not that we're trying to build the most amazing play structure ever, but we need safe and fun and developmentally appropriate equipment for kids, and that just takes ongoing refreshing. And so thank you for including that as part of, you know, we aren't just doing the splash park, it's that we're realizing that the whole thing. And having two pavilions will be an interesting um, addition to the space that has always been available there in terms of the lower, because it's such a popular place to have to use of the pavilion in the lower section, just so mm -hmm. that have an additional pavilion sounds fantastic. So people will like that. So one subtle but important point about Groff that a lot of people don't realize, and, and it factors into where our focus is, is that um, on the lower level, we get into many more resource areas because we're very close to the right Fort there. River, which is a very special river with regard to the unique um, um, uh, species that, that occur there. Um, so we are going to redo the pavilion on the lower level in pretty much the exact same footprint that it is. And that's a way that we can work with the Conservation Commission and, and they will be very appreciative of us not uh, you know, in, in, in increasing impervious surface, et cetera there. Um, but on the upper level, our goal, and we can't, we can't do all things for all people up there, but our goal is to do a playground and a spray park that has features that are appropriate for children of different ages. So the goal is to design it. That's why it's, it's really, um, we're, we're, we need an expert to do that. Because if we, we can all pick out of catalogs, but Dave Zomek doesn't know what the best features are for three to five year olds and then from six to nine year olds. And so this is why um, a Berkshire Design and they bring in uh, people from the companies that make these and then they come up with, with uh, the right mix of features. I do note, yes, we do have very, very old uh, play structures on the lower level of Groff, and that's something we're gonna have to really look at. Do we need them? Do we want them? Are they still safe? Uh, many people have said, oh, don't touch them, we kinda like them. Um, but definitely on the upper level, closest to the, to the restrooms, that all needs to be um, redone, and that's our goal. So the other thing I would just add regarding play structures is, you know, um, <clears throat> one of the things that's becoming more uh, to the forefront in design of those play structures is uh, accessibility. So that kids of all different kinds of and levels of accessibility, whether it be age-based or just physical-based, you know, is, is factored in as you do that. Um, there are some playgrounds in the area that, that have that in their design and, and people will drive a ways to go to a, a park that has those kinds of facilities. We absolutely must have that as a key 
criteria in our in our design. We have recent experience with that because, of course, the planning staff work very closely with the folks at Crocker Farm to design that wonderful CPA-funded, primarily CPA-funded, a new play structure at the Crocker Farm preschool and kindergarten. Just a, a couple of things, and it's just our first bite at the apple because I know we'll see more as it, it's evolving, but um, when you think about how you're going to use the upper and the lower play areas, it's also challenging when one is supervising young children and the four-year-old dashes to the lower and the two-year-old is at the upper, so it may be differentiating or thinking about, because I, I think some of the parks I've gone to, some really super duper ones, fall short where they don't make space for the people who are actually supervising the children, and that's shade. Not you know we need shade being out there in July when there's no school and you're, you know you're the grandparent and you're managing and it's just brutally hot for everybody. So enough shade and enough seating and areas so that you're appropriately watching but giving independence and then that thing of like one runs that way and one goes that way. So there's a lot to think about and of course the accessibility I'm yeah. sure will be integrated. And just to be clear, we're really, other than the pavilion, we're not really doing anything on the lower level in this phase. It's going to all be on the upper level. Absolutely shade, ADA, uh, seating, um, multi-purpose pavilion. How can it be used, you know, nine months a year, et cetera. So, and we're going to tie in the, the comfort station as well. You can tell what things we find exciting, and so <laughs> playground equipment. I loved. I, I didn't just pick it out of a catalog last time, Mr. Selma. Um, but I want to talk about accessibility again. I want to emphasize a little bit more what Mr. Slaughter said. Back when we designed Mill River almost 20 years ago, we looked at places that were. We went on many field trips, and we looked at places that were specifically designed to be really accessible as opposed to ADA required accessible. We made Mill River ADA required accessible. We did not make it the kind of magnet that there's a name of a child's playgrounds that's like a whole series of, of playgrounds that really fully integrates kids with different abilities and that science has changed a lot in the last 20 years. But then we chose not to do that, we just did what we had to do. And I encourage us to look and see if there's a way that we can do at least a portion of it in the more forward thinking ways with the more even more recent ways of looking at accessibility because we know that in Amherst we have a number of people who come here specifically because of our school programs that are available to us. And so to be, go beyond what's required, because of course we're going to do what's required. We have the little ramp, we have the engineered wood fiber, blah, blah, blah. But if we can look at it really carefully, I'm sure Berkshire Design or whoever can help us with that, but to consider it as more than just what's required, but perhaps looking at being a little closer to the cutting edge, because we did made that decision not to do that 20 years ago, and it is a draw. I was going to say cutting edge, but then I thought that might not be good for playground. <laughs> yes, no cutting edges. <laughs> I really appreciate the emphasis on the accessibility, and I will bring that forth to and through um, Berkshire Design. I will say that Mr. Bockelman and I, with Mr. Mooring, uh, Ms. Bills, have had fairly recent conversations about, you know, as we as we don't want to get ahead of ourselves here, but as we as we launch improvements to Groff. We have a master plan going for community field. We want to make sure that in time we come back around to Mill River because we do know that that playground, there are, you know, there are cycles and that cycle was 15, 20 years ago. Um, we have not gotten a park grant from the state in quite a while. You may recall that we applied for multiple park grants for North Common and for a variety of reasons the state didn't love that proposal. So our hope is to circle back around and the goal being having an updated current ADA accessible, exciting park, North, Central, and South Amherst. And you know that's our goal over the next five years. So thank you. So I have a couple of questions, um, not related to playgrounds, but um, so at the North Common, uh, if memory serves the sidewalk on the north side of the Main Street parking lot is gonna hold the bike share rack, which given that we've gone with the Bell wagon or whatever that group is, that the motorized will require power. So I presume as we redo the surface of that lot and we 
will need to you know run conduit to that space i presume is the case um the other thing i would suggest is just a thing to keep in mind not that it has to happen anytime soon that pbta has the ability to take basically a panel out of the bus shelter and turn it into a electronic signage and so if there's you know sort of standard power available to them they can do that they can also put solar on the roof if if necessary um it's a fairly heavily used bus bus stop there are others that are used more but just may not be something but it, it, if we're going to sort of tear up the sidewalk to do the parking lot and we're going to run power in that neighborhood it might be worthwhile to run the conduit whether it happens soon or not but just to put that in your mind is something to to keep in mind um but uh the one one question about that though is is that sidewalk on main street actually going to end up any wider i know that the lot itself is a little bigger than is sort of strictly necessary for a parking uh, as it's currently designed, so there's more space between cars uh, than is absolutely necessary to sort of back in, turn around. So, are they, is, is there some thought of widening that sidewalk, make more of a little plaza up on the corner near the lights, or not? Or can you? There talk have been it? discussions about that, but it's a little bit early right now um, because we're just getting our our designer on board. But certainly, that's come through as we've talked about that island that includes where the bike share will go and where the current bus stop is that we all recognize that that is a very, it's a hodgepodge of generations of bituminous pavement and concrete and, and, and whatnot. So we definitely want that to be a more welcoming space, a more accessible space. Um, we do have some room to, to move out in, in the right of way. Um, um, and we also have a little room. So it's something that Mr. Mooring and his staff will weigh in with, with our designers on. Um, I don't want to get, I don't know the specifics, but it's certainly been talked about. Okay. So it's on our radar screen. So the other thing I want to ask about is on the solar landfill. Um, you talked about it being a four megawatt. And again, this may be premature. Um, at some of the meetings way back when, you know, there was some discussion about whether it would all be, uh, would all the power be essentially sort of credited to the town or would, you know, some communities will build one of those and homeowners can buy essentially a certain section of, of power from it. So for example, my house is not a great, even though it's immediately adjacent to that property, is not a great, uh, doesn't have a great solar resource by virtue of the way the house sits and that sort of thing. But if there was a publicly available, you know, ability to buy my section, uh, to get myself credit for having solar, even though it's not physically there. There are those kind of things. Has that been part of the discussion at all, or is it mostly all going to be a, an agreement between um, Lee and, and the town only? Uh, we, we haven't got there. Com community solar is something that's becoming more and more popular. Um, the biggest uh, challenge oftentimes for a solar developer is having someone willing to take, off take the uh, power Mm -hmm. And they like to have one customer, i.e. the town, to say, uh, we will buy everything. There are a lot of solar developers out there who are marketing their power to different people, or, and they look at the big customers. Um, and I think the easiest path to success is to have one entity buy it, but doing a community solar option is, is certainly not out of the realm of reason. Do we know what our general year-over-year -year sort of total use is? I mean, is it, I think I, this I, was I mean, a quarter of the use. Yeah, we, so we could, we're not surplusing. No, right. So that's right. what I'm thinking. Like right. we I'm could use all of it, and then a well, little bit of plays into yeah, some. We've been approached by three different entities saying buy our solar from mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. places in Western Massachusetts. Right, and we're sort of holding out because we want to be. We want this project to go. Right, and we want them mm -hmm. not to have the ability. The fact that they haven't sold their solar to stop this project from moving forward. Right. So we want to be their customer. Right. Right. Other questions? Comments? I just want to note, you know, there's a, this is, there's a lot of, pro, there are a lot of projects in, in play right now. And, you know, Mr. Zomek is sort of really leading the charge on most of them. And um, it's, it's very <clears throat> ambitious and we've set some very ambitious timeframes, especially for the North Common. That one is probably, going to be a hard one to once people start to get their teeth into it and start to understand it and start asking questions i think we and think the the public process is going to be more involved but we have our goal and we're going to try and work towards that but i just you know credit him the department the various departments in the town for taking on all these projects and we're going to be very busy over the next year right right yep thank you yeah uh, mr slaughter can we have a five minute break absolutely 
Absolutely. So we'll take a little recess. Again, this is a quick look. I'll be back. We'll do updates. We'll keep the, the board very informed. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take a little recess so people can stretch your legs and get a drink of water or, or whatever, and then we'll be back in a moment. The physical, separate from that, what you want to put on it, just the physical location of the North Common is complex because there's so much hill there. All right, so we're back. We have uh, one other action and discussion item. 
uh, which is uh, medical marijuana procedures for letters of support and non-opposition. So last time we met, we um, we were discussing a couple of different things. We may potentially have another request for a letter of uh, support and non-opposition, but we also thought it would be wise to take a few minutes and think about, uh, since we haven't dealt with this in a while and we've got a little perspective on it and the circumstances around medical and, and recreational or adult use, um, marijuana has changed. Um, so I think we can take a, a little bit of time to, to think about how we would approach this. Um, what would be our criteria? Uh, how, in hindsight, we would think about it, what we would have or should have asked our previous uh, applicants for these letters and what we might be thinking about for any new applicants that come along um, in terms of what kind of uh, rationale we might apply to uh, giving a letter of support or non-opposition, which still is a odd term or pair of terms, I should say. So um, we have a few things in our packet just to sort of you know lay out um, where we are with applicants, uh, uh, location uh, of some of the, the currently approved letters. Uh, and then the letters themselves. Um, <clears throat> I didn't know if our resident experts <laughs> wanted to offer uh, some initial comment or uh, thoughts about uh, how they think about this or what their thoughts or <laughs> ideas are. <laughs> What they've heard from other communities because you guys have been sort of. Let me blurt it out and then you'll smooth it over. Okay, that yeah. sounds like a good plan. Because um, I mean, you've interacted with a lot of other communities who've you know grappled right. with some of these sort of you know points of conflict. There's a very different you know I, to my mind. Let me just frame it this way: is that I think that are we you know medical marijuana is a very different thing than the adult use, and I certainly think of them as very different things. And so I think that my approach to a letter of support on opposition is is we're not required to for the other, but for this, there's certain things I want to kind of press them about relative to the medical aspects of this. And so that's that's kind of where I've been sort of thinking about this a little bit, but I'm curious as to what other communities well, experience it out. When you see medical, just think adult use, because essentially with the new statute, the new legislation, there's no prohibition to the conversion. Right. So we may still be at the tail end of the medical licensing phase. And there, there are legitimate le medical components that still might happen and they'll be separated in a different tax structure and there's different reasons. But when you see a request for medical, or when I see a request for medical, I'm seeing adult use. So I, you can smooth that one out. Oh, it's, <laughs> no, it's only gonna get worse from here. So. Um, <laughs> So one of the things I asked the town manager just to check in with KP Law and make sure I hadn't missed something in all the pieces of paper we saw at MMA and all the other articles we read by the reams every week about um, marijuana of various sorts and affiliations um, from week to week. And one, we can't rescind, some communities talked about rescinding their letters of non-opposition and support, even if we wanted to, which I'm not saying we wanted to, but just in terms of knowing our options, we actually can't do that because they already got their provisional certificates of registration, so that's a non-starter anymore. Um, one of the things that's so interesting, of course, though, is that we have to provide, in order for them to get that provisional certificate, a letter of support or non-opposition. However, as things currently stand with, let's just say, non-medical uh, marijuana, we don't have to provide anything, except they just say, ah, you, it meets the zoning good enough for us, which is one of the things we've been working on at all the hearings, because it makes no sense to me, based on the conversations we've had over the years here, that we who clearly our community supported medical marijuana. We forthrightly and quickly did zoning in 2013 to make it happen. We gave all these people letters and none of them opened. And I'm really mad, 
jealous even, that East Hampton is saying, our community was so forward-thinking in allowing medical marijuana. It's like, so were we. <laughs> we can't help it. They didn't open. And so we did all the things we needed to do. And so I'm feeling frustrated that we went through this when we didn't have any idea when we were, when we did those original letters of support and non-opposition that there was going to be a provision that allowed them to automatically transition into non-medical use. And yet we asked them all these hard questions about who are you really? Are you really a nonprofit? Are you really medical? Are you just, you know, saying this or do you seem to have professional staff associated with this? I mean, we were really trying to do our due diligence. And now it doesn't really seem to matter because they're all going to be allowed to flip to, to non-medical use and without us giving that letter of support or non-opposition. The only saving grace is that they will have to have signed host community agreements at some point in the process, which they did not have to have technically. It was a little unclear with just the medical and we only got to that point with one of the organizations but those will be a necessary component of everything that happens after July 1st under the new regulations. So in terms of how, well, the reason I want to talk about this is one, I wanted to, I guess, vent about that. And I'm really unhappy that we don't already have medical. And one of the reasons I wanted to have medical was because I wanted to have medical because our community made it very clear that's one of our values. And we wanted to offer people pain relief in our community. And we're really disappointed it hasn't opened. Um, even though we've given out four letters. Two is that we're really dis I'm really disappointed that we haven't done it because then we haven't seen any of the ramifications. And so people being worried about things that have or have not come to fruition because none of them have opened, although one of them is making substantial progress. Um, so we still don't have much to go on beyond theoretical stuff at this point. I believe Mr. Bachman can speak to what town council did say in terms of if someone comes forward to us as we've heard maybe happening with one of the organizations that's already received a letter but is potentially looking at new ownership that there's a a suggestion from town council as to how we might handle that rather than that idea of like rescinding or withdrawing a letter per se so that those that there would be clear transfer of one to the other as opposed to there being five instead of four because one of the reasons we chose that number eight which was not highly scientific but was based to a degree on we assumed that at some point these four would move forward because again even though July 1st regulations I have no doubt will be in place given how fast the Cannabis Control Commission is moving that doesn't mean anybody's going to open and so some of these may just wander off and, and decide to open someplace else or put their interests elsewhere. Um, and others may open as both medical and recreation, non-medical, or they may just oh, they may just transfer completely to the other. I mean, we just don't know at this point. So that's why I'm having a hard time understanding if at this point our attitude needs to be kind of whatever, because there's like really not much more to say about medical at this point or are we trying to get at some other types of information that we hear from people before we issue another letter because to some extent we've learned stuff over time we've learned that in hindsight it might have been smart to issue an RFP rather than just accepting whoever showed up in whatever order they showed up in but that's what we did too late now so is there any point in belaboring this more than I already just have? And we're just saying, sure, that, that sounds good to whoever comes in, knowing that they're going to be under whatever regulations come into place July 1st. Or do we have something concrete we can really ask them that we feel will make a difference to our community beyond what town council suggests in terms of making clear that we've got four, not five? The, the thing I think about is that, and this is to some extent, you know, building off what Ms. Kruger said, is that I think at this point the intention of getting this is to get a leg up on the competition to go into non-medical use. Mm -hmm. And so I think that changes my lens relative to whether we want to do that or not. In other words, we have four that currently have that leg up, which is half of the eight that we've decided as a town to allow. Do we want to tip the scales more or less? And the thing is, is the process to go through the medical 
is fairly extensive. You know, it's it's a fairly extensive and expensive process. And so we talked. You know, some of the conversation when we were talking about zoning is, do we create a level playing field for all people who want to? You know, that that uh, so more people can access this business opportunity. Um, and so I, I have some real reservations about issuing any more, just from the standpoint of I think we've given half the, the eight kind of a, a head start on everybody else. Um, at the same time, I'm not sure it makes that big a difference given the, the amount of time between now and July 1. But anyway. So um, my question is, can, how far can we go in talking about how many legs we want up when you know, I don't want to wander into the specifics of a request because it's not on our agenda, but um, I think I'm feeling similarly to what I think you said. Um, I, I would be just as happy to have three strictly medical coming along and then evaluate what the other up to, you know, five more looked like under the new rules of the game, which we, you know, we probably know about 90% of what it's going to look like and not the rest. I don't, I don't see any, um, I think we got ahead of ourselves, in, you know, in some ways in trying to have an open humanitarian view and then the rules of the game changed. Um, and I'm looking at the map with the three locations and I, I have different ideas about whether that's good or bad just like from a planning perspective of density and location and I go back and forth about it's good that they're all together, it's not good, gee this corner lot has all kinds of redevelopment potential that you know isn't be, you know wasn't realized in the application that we already had maybe it would in some other so you know does how I feel about how I want to see this corner lot redeveloped have anything to do with whether that should be adult use marijuana by itself, standalone. So I, you know, I don't, I don't know. Mr. Wall. I can be brief, thanks. I think you've already stated the issues, all the three of you very nicely, you know, that problems with the process that got us to this point and the fact I don't feel any particular urgency in granting yet another one under uncertain circumstances. So um, I'll leave it at that. Mr. Steinberg, anything else? Yeah, I'm not sure that I have much I could say that would contribute to anything that we could do tonight. It, questions that would come along if we did receive another request that we were acting upon is whether um, if we have um, reached the eight point by the, uh, for um, adult use marijuana sales facilities and then get another one that comes in um, for medical, whether the medic that medical marijuana t um, has any rights attached to it to expand beyond just medical and that's a hypothetical question that I'd care about under those circumstances, but doesn't need answer now. And uh, the other thing that I wonder about, however, is um, <clears throat> it's my understanding, and this is maybe just educational question, not entirely related. It's my understanding that with the medical marijuana uh, establishments that they're required to grow within Massachusetts under in, in facilities that are also licensed by uh, the Department of Public Health. Um, are there any similar restrictions for other adult use marijuana uh, production? Well, the grow facilities are all under regulations and I believe some of the DPH stuff is gonna switch over to the CCC. Right. I mean. It, well, it would have to be in Massachusetts because they can't transport across state lines. And, but it's not required to be vertically integrated. So that's one of the things that, for example, GTI, which you read about in the newspaper, I'm not speaking out of school here, GTI is the furthest along. They're up on Meadow Street, and they're building a facility in Holyoke to grow. And so 
they have to grow it themselves under some part of GTI in order to sell it here or at any other dispensary medical wise. Once it becomes available to the world of Massachusetts on July 1, then recreational places will be able, like a different recreational place or non, non-medical place would be able to buy from GTI if GTI wanted to sell to them, as opposed to it having to all be vertically integrated within the same company. So there will be a lot more choices, although again, you know, you have to start planting stuff in order to sell it, and that hasn't happened a lot of places yet. That's still, I mean, we're still under 20 in terms of active medical dispensaries in the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts, which I think is a lot slower than a lot of people expected given the county restrictions that got lifted years ago. So that's part of it. In terms of the eight, you bring up an excellent point that we've been discussing in the, that we talked about associated with the eight, but also that we've been trying to clarify in our internal working group, which is that we want to make sure in terms of like retailers versus establishments, like what counts as that eight, and we have never counted and we would not intend to count and we want to make sure our definitions don't count every medical, non-medical site as two. They would only count as four. So if every one of the four that is currently licensed to do medical and also both. did non-medical, it would still only count as four. It would not count as eight, is my understanding, because otherwise then eight wouldn't have been enough because they might have all done that. And that wouldn't have solved our all the other issues of why we said we wanted a larger number than the number that currently exists. But you are exactly right that that's one of the definitions that the zoning subcommittee is looking at bringing to um, town meeting, annual town meeting, to make sure it's clear, because Mr. Mora also realized that after the fact that he wanted to have the differentiation between retailers, establishments, whatever that means, to be totally clear on that. So in theory, if all of these places, if we hadn't heard anything about anybody considering doing anything else, all these places could establish a separate non-medical arm and it would still only count as four because it would still be on the same site. Mm -hmm. Now, if they said we want to have another location and that's the one that's going to be the non-medical and we're only going to do medical at this site, then that would count, then there's still that definition question we have to be clear on to make sure does that count as five or does that count as numerous outlets of one place? And so we want to make sure that what we thought was eight, at least we all agree on what eight means in terms of how it counts. Thank you. Uh, While well, marijuana is on the floor, I might just give you a little update. We've been struggling, and it's come up at a couple of hearings and workshops we've been to, the, the cafe or, or social consumption aspect, and not being opposed or, or um, non-opposed, it's un unclear how it would work for a bunch of reasons. It's complicated and also juggling that with no smoking laws and, and uh, workplace, <coughs> smoke-free workplace stuff. And you might have heard that the governor actually weighed in and asked the Cannabis Control Commission to delay that part of the regulations because, again, not opposed or, or not opposed. Um, it's just way more complicated. But be thinking, once that gets worked out, we might have the eight licensees plus we could have other locations for social consumption. I don't know if that would how that fits with the aid or not. So a whole other layer that, I mean, I, I, I think waiting probably makes sense just because we it's, it's complicated and we have a lot of unanswered questions. And the rollout of this is a lot as it is, the adult use part. Right, and just to make that a little more specifically complicated is that East Hampton is already has somebody who's already planning to open a social consumption place, their zoning allows for it. But again, how's smoking going to work? Because you're not supposed to be able to smoke. And so then there's a place in Worcester that's opened that's a private club where you can smoke anything you want, according to their website. And um, <clears throat> not clear how that works, because Cannabis Con Control Commission said that that's not ours. We didn't write any regs for that. Mm -mm, you, got, you got a problem with your... Uh, smoking regulations then at that point that's not our problem but then it's the matter of you know we're trying to be proactive so that we don't have a place open 
and then we have to fight with them about whether or not they're doing what's entirely appropriate and so or in the spirit of the law versus a lawsuit so one of the things we tried to get across certainly when at the hearing i was at as i said we know people are going to get sued we just rather not get sued first so could <laughs> you, you said, please you help us that? with some more <laughs> details so we don't get sued first as to how this works so because they remember you that's we, i hope so you want to be the president <laughs> exactly because we want to try and do things that support what our community values, but we also wanted to do it with eyes wide open as to what we're allowing and not what we're, and what we're not allowing. And like you say, social consumption would not count at, to the best of any of our assumptions as eight. But again, when we came up with that number eight, we weren't really planning that social consumption was gonna be a thing right off the bat. So we didn't have the draft regs. We're continually, I said, I, the other thing I said is we're predicting the future as fast as we can, but um, it's, it's been a little tricky as, as to how to do that because we don't know what they're actually going to end. And they have, the Cannabis Control Commission has been getting immense pressure from all the, quote, sticks in the mud about um, not doing social consumption right out of the gate. But so it, they're hearing some positives and some negatives at the hearings because we attended two different hearings. And so we know they heard both associated with that because one of the issues is it's being treated as a social justice issue that that could potentially be a place where people who have in the past don't have the big money to buy into creating a storefront but social consumption is a different level of investment right. you don't have to have x number of dollars to back you up to get a certain kind of license so um it, everything's more complicated than so. it seems. So the reason I want to talk about this tonight was to see if there was anything we needed to think about in terms of if we do have someone come forward to us from one of these four groups or even just a completely different group and say yeah, they want something. It's like, how do we say, how do we decide? How, I mean, I'm not saying we're deciding on the merits of their app because we don't have it. But what I'm saying is what questions will we even ask knowing what we know now versus what we knew then? I don't know. I mean, we can ask just random questions, but I, that doesn't help us like necessarily decide what that means. I mean, is there some form? We talked about criteria earlier tonight associated with different kinds of things. Criteria to help us decide if property surplus. Criteria to help us decide various things. How do we even frame the conversation? Well, I certainly think, for me anyway, I think at a minimum, because it is a letter relative to medical marijuana, that they should have the sort of, whether they fully intend to go rec, you know, non-medical use or not, um, they should have their you know, proverbial ducks in a row relative to medical. Because if you, you know, it, it's, it's disingenuous at a minimum to come in and say that they want to do medical but not have you know, the, the sort of pieces in place. It's like, what's your, you know, medical plan? Do you have a medical director? Do you have, you know, I mean, we saw some relatively sophisticated plans from, from our previous uh, requesters uh, relative to, you know, delivering um, marijuana in a medical environment in a, in a serious way. And so I'm, I'm definitely going to hold them to that if, if that comes before us, because I think if you want a letter of non-opposition or support relative to a medical facility, you got to be a medical facility, so I'm going to do that personally anyway. Um, I think you know, at this point, given that we know what we know about non-medical use, then I think we're going to ask those questions too about: um, Do you have plans to transition or additionally uh, open recreational? Because I think that starts to change how you think about the location a little bit, um, but still evolving on what I'm thinking about these things. Mr. Steinberg. It's very conf difficult because I'm not even convinced that any of these places that have gotten to uh, the point that they're at in the process, level three or whatever it's yeah, called, provisional, provisional licensing, actually have to open as medical facilities in order to get right. their adult use license. And so, uh, you know, all of the presentation and all of the good questions we asked in hindsight, um, what do they mean? Um, could we ask for a more intricate business plan uh, than we did? 
Possibly, but, um, and would we think about that in the future? Possibly. Um, those are the kinds of things that we might think about. Um, if a criteria that we have um, is that we want no more than four of the eight to be um, also medical um, in order to bring a variety, a larger variety of uh, providers into the community, then that's um, a principle that we ought to um, test to see whether we can, in fact, implement it, and then um, that should be the discussion. I agree with the two preceding comments. I think Mr. Slaughter makes a good point. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen, and we obviously, well, maybe we do know what's going to happen, but I think for the very, for the sake of consistency alone, it's, it's proper to ask for all the information we did for the rest. I mean, otherwise, we're not doing our due diligence, I think. And again, we did, as you said, we did a very detailed plans about the medical expertise, the delivery, the security. We got down to building plans, and, and that's the least we can do. And then, as Mr. Steinberg said, to inquire into further prospects and to keep that number four in mind. I've just been thinking, I mean, usually we're kind of at the front end of a process, and then we say, well, you know, it's going to go to the ZBA or the planning board or both. They're going to look at plans and what it looks like and maybe design review board. It, it might be that before we give anything, we want to really know what particular site is going to look like, how it's going to benefit the community, you know, if it is that corner site, for example, how does, how does that work? Is that the best, you know, way to use that site? I mean, we, we can actually use our position to maybe be, be a lot more proactive about what we're going to get. Just a thought. Just, again, talking about process, not any particular cases, as you recall, when we did have that conversation, we were, we made sure to raise the issues of uh, past ownership and uses versus the potential future ownership and use without, you know, without saying we want to pick winners and losers or decide what business should go where. That was part of the conversation, at least as a general consideration. So I think we're entirely within our rights to, to keep doing that. whether to say another thing or not. <laughs> it gets into, you get into some strange places if you want to, you know, um, so for example, some of what they talked about was how they would interact with police in our, our uh, police department to provide, you know, uh, security footage and the interaction with, you know, care and control of the product and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And so there was a certain public outreach component that they had, some of them had, if I remember correctly, about how they were going to, you know, essentially interact within the community. Um, you know, it's like, to what extent can we ask those questions or, and perhaps that's more appropriate for a host community agreement about, you know, compelling them to do certain kinds of things within our community. Because uh, we have a lot, you know, we've talked about this too, is that, you know, we have a, a large number of relatively vulnerable, you know, uh, people. Uh, as far as, you know, that aren't quite of age or even are of age but may not be well suited to make great decisions because, <laughs> you know, uh, they're still, you know, young. Um, and, we, you know, we've talked about, you know, having a certain responsibility to, to, to those members of our community in that regard and not to overly uh, parent them but at the same time to, to create circumstances where they, you know, make the best choices they can, I guess, in some respects. I don't know how much of that kind of series of questions we could impose or ask about. Um, and again, it may be a part and parcel of like a host community agreement structure that we, you know, sort of press them on certain, uh, you know, sort of community building and uh, community outreach kind of things. You know, in much the same way when, you, you know, if you look at every lottery ticket, there's a thing about getting ga gambling help. You know, there's sort of certain hooks on, on some of these kinds of things. Um, so I don't know. You know, maybe again, perhaps you know, a, a host community agreement kind of captures that, or has the ability to capture some of that sort of stuff. But anyway, yes. So, so you, there are a couple of hypotheticals. Suppose a new company comes in and says we want to um, open a new place. So the question is, is that something the board would like to entertain, 
or suppose a company comes in and says we want to transfer our license to company A, company one to company B, is that something you want to entertain as a board or are you saying we're going to wait until July 1 to see what comes out because we're, it's, it's, we're not ready to talk about this anymore? There's no, I don't think there's anything that compels you to talk to people if they come in, but if you get that request, hypothetically, um, what should our response be on your behalf? Thank you. I really appreciate that question. And so um, back to the host community for just a moment. The host community agreement is negotiated by the town manager. And although, of course, he is going to listen to us in all our infinite wisdom when he debates that, it isn't like it gets debated here or that it gets debated in executive session or anything like that. It's just like once it's at that point, it's it's off our plate. Right. So we know he'll represent us well and get us a really good deal. But um, that's there's only so much we can influence for that. Um, I appreciate you saying that nothing compels us to do this because, you know, we're always trying to think of, you know, on the one hand, Amherst is open for business and then another, and, you know, we support medical happening, absolutely, and we even support non-medical. We're just a little concerned about how the details are gonna play out, but we support both. And with all the things that we always talk about, although I said the last time, I'm not gonna tell you again all the statistics about how young our population is, but that's huge for us, absolutely. I think the other thing that you know becomes problematic is as we as we talked about associated with a release from 61A earlier, and I, when I quite harshly said, well, you know, your closing deadline is not our problem, but the reality is it's not. And so on the one hand, we want to do the right thing for people, absolutely, and I'm really glad that that's going to work out for them, but it's not our problem, and so. There is no medical place, given the current situation of the four that exist, that can actually start offering product as a medical establishment prior to July 1st. I would be really shocked if GTI has anything available based on their growing. And so literally no one's going to be selling anyway as of July 1st. So then maybe that to some extent changes the conversation too than if this was happening a year ago. If a year ago, sort of right after the regs came out, when we didn't know what the timelines were for sure and there was theoretical possibility, but at this point there's no longer a theoretical possibility that any of these medical places are going to open in time as far as I can tell based on where they are in their plan and their own vertical integration because of the fact they have to grow their own. So I feel less worried that somehow economic development wise, we're saying we're putting, we don't want to feel like we're being unfair or that we're putting on the brakes on anyone from that standpoint. And I don't, that's what I'm saying is I don't think we are, but I would also be interested to hear what the rest of the board thinks if we would want to hear, as, as Mr. Bachman indicated, do we want to even hear from anybody associated with these things? but make it clear that if we do want to hear from them, that it's not necessarily a slam dunk. We, we don't want to mislead anyone, but do, are we willing to hear from them at all, or is there a point to hearing from them at all, given how we feel about this? So that he knows the answer to that question. Because if somebody asks you theoretically today, since we haven't really sorted this out, should they bother coming before us or should they not? And if they do, do we just say, sure, you can try? <laughs> we don't know where we're going with it. We don't have like this nice little checklist that you can see if you meet that, and therefore we'll say yes. I'm, I'm inclined to let people come in and talk to us, and it doesn't. In being clear that that doesn't mean because they're on the agenda that you know any we know what action we might take. That just you know looking at a lot of different alternatives, but. I think to not even allow somebody to come in and talk to us does say like we're not open for business <clears> in a certain way and I think it also makes Mr. Kravitz's job very awkward where he's trying to, <laughs> I was going to say cultivate relationships. <laughs> 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 no, you did not. Yeah, did not. <laughs> um, but I think he's, you know, I. And then we have the conversation where he's, you know, maybe the maybe the conversation is yes, but. Um, and I hear your thing about the timeline and no one is going to be able to meet that. But in general for the industry, as people come in and have something we're interested in and it's part of the eight, 
they have certain you know business benchmarks they need to make or they're going to walk away so maybe it's somebody you want to say yeah hey great come back in july or this is where we're stuck or we really like you you're offering us something nobody else talked about before so i'm into listening i'm into going that far without creating too much expectation i would i would suggest i would i'm in the same camp as that um you know i'm certainly fine with with hearing people out um but making no promises about whether we'll make any decision that evening or or any other evening um you know we might we might not i just don't know you know uh, but i don't i think that's the clear thing we can say is like you can come down and talk to us we may do nothing we may do we may say no immediately we may say yes immediately or we may wait two weeks and say yes two weeks later or no two weeks later or whatever i think all of those things are within the realm i think um but i agree with you i think hearing them at least they like you say they may offer some they may tell us something we haven't heard before that really strikes us in a way that's very different than anybody else so i think that's you know worth being open to the possibilities mr steinberg do you have something yeah, I, I mean i think that though it's fair to say listening to as we encapsulate this conversation that if there's a request for a transfer of a current uh, medical marijuana to a new provider or a new request that we will be asking a full set of questions going into all of the criteria that have been discussed tonight, including the, which is mostly the criteria from before. But I think that uh, Ms. Kruger has certainly articulated an additional one, which is, is this the best and highest use of the location? And um, the second is that uh, we are at least at the moment disinclined to um, have more than four that are selling both medical and adult use though that's not a concrete policy it's just um was i think where the conversation was going before uh, but uh other than that, I, I agree that if somebody wants to come in, that um, they should be entitled to appear. And for them, I don't think that that's a major expense in comparison to all the other expenses they anticipate right. taking on. We do want to be dazzled, though. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Is there anything else anyone wants to add on this? I wanted to just add about the questions that we ask. And so we each made up those questions based on what, because, you know, we have to everything in open meeting, that we thought were good questions to ask. There is no set, I mean, there might be for each of us individually, but there is no set questions to ask. And that's one of the things I was referencing when I said there's no checklist they can look at and say, oh, well, I've, I meet seven of these ten criteria. I know what exactly what they're going to, they should look at our old tapes. Mm -hmm. Then they'd know what we were going to ask them. But we don't have a document. We don't have a criteria document that says these are the things we're looking for and partly it's because things continue to unfold and so we're not gonna make one it right. doesn't sound like um, before any of that happens but but because we don't have that we also we ourselves are depending on our own knowledge gained over the last couple of years of doing this of asking those questions rather than it being something we hand out and say these are the questions all right so I think it's been for me, it's been productive to hear each of you, and, and certainly if anyone's still watching, if they have <laughs> comment or suggestion for us, certainly write us an email, because I certainly you know, uh, don't have a monopoly on good ideas, so <laughs> send those things in to us, but I think we're trying to you know, wrap our heads around this, and, and uh, I found this productive. Um, so moving on in our agenda, um, the more sort of pro forma sort of stuff. Uh, next up is committee and board appointments, reappointments. Um, we have an appointment there. Um, if someone would like to offer a motion. I'll make a motion and then uh, if uh, Ms. Kruger wants to add to it because she was probably involved with the interview and knows the criteria for this committee and the various people to serve, Please she can add to it. I move to appoint Sharon Povinelli to the Downtown Parking Working Group through June 30, 2018. And there's a second. So, 
segueing perfectly off what Mr. Steinberg said, we don't have a copy of the charge in here. We should always have a copy of the charge, except maybe when we're doing a whole bunch of appointments in June. Maybe that's not a good time. But for something like this, where we did ask for specific sorts of skills and experiences in particular, I think it's valuable. And for us to be able to look at the balance of the committee, et cetera, we should always have the charge in here. And I realize that you know staff gets other priorities going too. But that should just be on a checklist somewhere that the charge goes in with the CAF so that we're all reminded, oh, right, that's who's on that already, and these are why. And also the date, because the date, I believe, is because much to Mr. Bagg's disappointment back when he was still with us, I said I wanted to have this be a time-limited committee. So is, is, that the, is that the date everybody's at? By 6.30, yeah. Yeah, and that's why it's got that date, which is very soon in comparison to many of our other appointments. Right. Well, let me ju let me just add that um, uh, Ms. Povinelli, um, many of you might know, is one of the owners of a downtown business, Hastings, not a secret, um, and would be replacing um, Matt Yee, who was a downtown business manager. So she's sort of manager owner. We. Have somewhat stuck with the original slots, but as we've lost people, we've mm -hmm. tried to fill in with appropriate members rather than necessarily the letter of that. If you might recall that Ms. Anderson was on there as a sort of parking facilities, you know, person, that's unlikely we're going to find that. So we've we've been flexible. We want someone who sort of knows the issues who can who. And Ms. Povinelli has come to a number of meetings, participated, and has participated with the parking garage subcommittee of the downtown parking working group. So she was enough up to speed that it was good because we may be finishing our two years, July, or may come back here and say, hey, give us another six months or something. I still see it as a shorter, not a standing ongoing committee, but whether July 1 is the absolute right time to fold, we're going to have that conversation in the spring. So um, we did interview her, Mr. Malloy and myself, and um, I actually, I don't know exactly how the ball got dropped, but I thought we had done this appointment a couple weeks ago and we hadn't, and because we had said, yep, go ahead, but whether I didn't put it in writing or I just didn't talk, so I actually thought she had been appointed and hadn't gotten her letter when she asked me. So in a way, we're, this is a little bit of a makeup, but I, I think she would be appropriate. I'm sorry you didn't have the charge, but we did look at that and yeah. I never so. meant to imply that Ms. Povinelli wasn't incredibly no, no, I know well qualified. I know, I know that. It's simply as yeah, a matter of the structure, right. that's yep, what that we should be that's doing. Part of I'm the perfectly you pleased you've been able to fill the slots after we belabored how to fill them the first time. So thank you. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And I, she, she'll be very happy to get her she appointment. Now yes. she will get a letter. <laughs> all right, so next up on our agenda is uh, section seven, which is licensed as public way meter parking reservations. We have consent calendar. Are there any yes. edits to those, please? There is one edit and then I can make a motion. Um, to match to make the motion match the requests oh, um, <laughs> um, the first one which is the all alcohol beverages at a reception in the life sciences lab 320 is what is in the application form oh. um, it's not s330 um, and with that since I did pare it all out, I'm perfectly prepared to make a motion to approve the items listed on the consent calendar for the February, I'm pausing here, 12, 2018 agenda as amended. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in wait, favor. Wait, oh, wait, nice wait. try. Oh, Try to slaughter. move it along you here. You have to lift your head up and look. <laughs> That's an intentional thing. I remember thing, those you know. days. That's right. Line. You just don't look around, and then you don't have any discussion. Oh, yeah, it works right. out right. super well. No, please go ahead. Um, I'm sorry. I really <laughs> so didn't we're here just I... grumbling under my breath. So <laughs> it's a little weird that UMass is having an alcohol reception in one of the dining commons. It's a little weird. 
given all the talk we have about alcohol use on campus. But it appears, and I had meant to double check this earlier, but it appears that that's the night before spring recess starts. So it's on the 10th, yeah. and the 11th is when spring recess starts. So um, sure, I guess. I mean, we obviously have the well, chief of police look at this, but it's, it's a little they, strange. One, think that one would think they would be serving food, hot sandwiches, soups, et cetera, <laughs> that's part of that list of common victuals that we often request or ask for, but um, oh, any other A little dubious, we we'll have to check IDs. I'm a little yeah. dubious, but all right. <laughs> any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that's unanimous. All right, so now we're in, we've done all those sort of voting whatnot. We're on to the town manager's report. Huh? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So first off, a um, couple things I want to mention. One is um, our cup of Joe will be Friday at Share Coffee, and I'll be with Building Commissioner Rob Mort Mora from 7.30 to 9 a.m. at Share Coffee. That's this Friday. Um, secondly, I want to mention that uh, I want to thank LSSC um, for a great Winterfest. They, they expanded this year from a one day affair to a one week affair. And if you look at the number of events that they had organized or had sort of put under their umbrella over the course of a week, it was pretty impressive. And I think that um, everybody other than Mr. Wald's dog enjoyed <laughs> enjoyed the event. Um, what happened to your dog? <laughs> Didn't like fireworks. fireworks. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was, they, they, they really, uh, took a chance. They had a lot of energy um, from volunteers who wanted to make this happen. They received a lot of support from um, fraternities and sororities. So congratulations to Barb Bills and her staff for being ambitious, trying to get do a little bit more, and good for them. Um, the um, uh, also, like, you guys will talk about that. Um, just as a follow-up, uh, if you recall, a couple meetings ago, you had approved the uh, alcoholic beverages license hours change for Amherst Cinema subject to the police chief's um, review, and he has approved it, so that has been issued. Um, th there is a, um, we, we talked at one point about, um, uh, I think last time, about uh, safety measures that can, the town can implement at voting places, and at the same that same evening, the police chief uh, was meeting with the school committee about suggested changes that to both physically for some of the spaces, but in particular one um, for the Cracker Farm School to have a police officer on duty. So today we received a letter uh, which we will put in your packet um, for information. I don't think you need to take action on it necessarily. Uh, it's something that we would accommodate um, based on if the police chief says it's a necessity for us to have a, an officer and the, the school committee is requesting it, it's something we would look at our budget to make sure that it just happens. Um, unless anybody says that's a really dumb idea. But I think that's there's a, a, a resident who came in and spoke to you as well at, that, at some point. Um, the, I want to note that um, last last meeting we gave you a litigation status update. There was a mistake on it. I sent you a replacement just so everybody's aware that there is a replacement that's been uh, uploaded on that. Um, next meeting um, will be focused on, which is in two weeks. Um, tonight was sort of the David Zomack, uh, Sandra Aldridge showed. Next time will be um, all about a lot of DPW things, and that will include the um, second meter for agricultural use regulations that we'll be presenting to you. It will include a presentation on pavement management, which is very timely because I think if you drive around the town, <laughs> we I don't think it's called management anymore. I think it's just survival. Um, but you know, we have a very detailed uh, presentation on that. So I think it'll be really interesting. We have a number of other things that involve DPW, just updates as much as um, uh, sort of where we're headed on a lot of these major projects for DPW. Um, 
but the big one will be the second meter for uh, agricultural use that will will have the information to you in advance um, and um, the uh, da, da, da. Mm, there was a, another thing in here. Oh, um, yeah. So we're um, we had got if, as I told you we had gone out to bid for ambulance billing to uh, as a, um, a contracted service, and we have uh, received numerous um, bids on that. Uh, we are going to go into contracting out our ambulance billing. We have worked through the staffing issues internally, uh, which includes some collective bargaining issues, and. Um, and that will all work, that will begin on March 1st. Um, and so we're in the fire department and uh, treasurer's collector's office are both prepared and, and ready to launch into this initiative. We think that it will provide, um, take, take a very important task and give it to a company that specializes it in it because there's a lot of um, nuances to ambulance and billing for medical services that um, it's really hard for our staff to stay up to speed on it because things change all the time and these companies are out there and they almost every very few cities and towns do their own ambulance billing anymore. It's all contracted out. Um, so it's a good thing to do and I think we're, we're pretty in a pretty good space staff wise. It's, it's an accommodation the staff will have to make. Uh, it'll be some, there's some negative impacts for some employees, but um, I think we've been communicating that with folks and they're okay. Um, and then I have to request if the, we, right before coming down here, um, uh, we received the final wording on the charter question, summary of the charter question uh, from town council, who uh, the charter commission met last week, uh, had come up with language, town council had comments on it, they were going back and forth. Um, but, and was, I neglected to ask the chair to put this on the, the agenda for tonight, so I have to ask if you're willing to have a special meeting um, to vote to place the question, the charter question on the ballot. The reason it would have to be this week is that it has to be done 35 days prior to the election, which is February 20th. Um, there is an opportunity to meet at 1030 on Friday, on Thursday, because um, two members of the board will be here for JCPC until 10-ish, and then, or t until 10 or 1030. And then two members from the board will be for the here for the marijuana working group at 11. So there's an opportunity, at least three of you, I know are gonna be in the building in that time frame. Um, and I'm not sure if the chair was gonna be able to make it or not in Mr. Wald's schedule. So that was, um, it would have been nice to have had the language finished and ready for you to review tonight. But really it's a, uh, according to town council, you have to take the action, but it's really a ministerial action of saying, yes, we want to put this on the ballot. Ms. Brewer. So, so to, cl to beat that to a little more detail, yep. um, so we are only, as a select board, all we do is agree that, and we, in fact, already agreed to this a long time ago, we just didn't vote to put the question on the ballot because you, we're required to do that after the Charter Commission says we finished our work, so we have to put the question on that normally reads under MGL, shall this town, and just to make things interesting, the Charter Commission wants it to say shall Amherst as opposed to shall this town, but the rest of the words are just what they say at MGL, it, and that's the question, and then that's the thing that we say yes, and then by putting that on, the Charter Commission is entitled to put their explanation and we've seen a draft of that as the entire board i'd seen a previous draft it has been changed again numerous times since then because it went back through the charter commission itself and then went back to town council again as you've described and so we don't get to have any say per se on what they write for their part um it's kind of the equivalent of when the galvin puts out the red book on the on the uh, questions, we might have an opinion as to how long it ought to be. Because, you know, it's already a long ballot. They're going to have to flip over the page. Hopefully, um, I had suggested we talk with Ms. Burgess about making sure it starts on the front page so nobody gets confused and forgets that they have to turn it over. Um, but beyond that, it really has nothing to do with us except based on our amazing wisdom over the years. Um, I had suggested to the Charter Commission that we 
if any of us individually have input based on the drafts we've seen so far, even though knowing they've changed, if there was something that you saw that just was like, wow, are you sure you wanted to mention this or you didn't want to mention that, you could individually tell the chair of the Charter Commission that, but as a group, we don't need we don't vote on that because that's not our part. Our part's only the part at of MGL, and they get to do the other part, and we don't have to accept what they say. It's just they just turn it into the town clerk, and it's got nothing to do with us. It's done. It's our, I mean, we're not doing it tonight, but it's not done. We're fast having input, I thought. I mean, it's done. Well, as I said, wouldn't just be before, a great time to. <laughs> Just as I said before, we came down, town council had made recommendations, and the, the chair of the Charter Commission has been granted some, some leeway from his um, commission to make some changes, and, um, but if anything major, he would reconvene the commission and go back to them. Right. Um, to reconvene before our deadline to, to vote to put this Unless it's no. like you see a, t a, a comma or something. No, we, uh, no. No, no yeah. they don't have to reconvene before our meeting. Our meeting is only for our part. Because their summary could change. Their right? summary, yeah. they can keep changing up until Still, the minute that right. Ms. Burgess right. says they have right. to turn so just it in. the upper part of the, the question. Exactly. And, okay. and, the, and the, so the question was, who's authorized to tell the town clerk to put a question on the ballot? And it's really just you right. who right. has the authority so to do could, that. We could do it Thursday and would be within the 48 hour thing. We would post it tomorrow morning if we could get a quorum for that. You're in both places, right? Yeah. And so, and so, yes, we could do that. But what I'm saying is, I know that you saw a draft, a previous draft. It's been changed since then. But if you really had a strong opinion about, don't wordsmith it. But if you had a really strong opinion about a concept that was or was not included, then that would be worth sharing with the chair of the charter commission. But it doesn't come to us as a board. Were you saying 10:30? I was thinking 10:30. Yeah. 10:45. Yeah. Whatever you find easiest. 10:30. Okay. Are there other questions for the manager or other things so, you so have? Just, yes, so will we have a quorum at that point? I'll be there. Do you need just a quorum? Or? We just need a quorum. It's, it's a, just the charter right. to say, yes, the question yeah, goes on the ballot. Day and I could try to change some of the buttons I have to do. Well, I'll be here for JCPC. I was hoping not to hang around for very long afterwards because I'm actually leaving town that night. Do you want to make it but, 10? Uh, I could probably get there earlier. That. It's a two-minute task. Depends he doesn't team. want to wait till 10.30 is what I'm saying. Oh, oh. I could come it's, earlier. PC, it's hard to get it. I mean, we try to end, like last week we ended at 10 the other week. It's hard to just drop everything and rush out. Maybe even 10.15 would be a Also, oh, whenever it's like, convenient. Like, on your agenda for yeah. JCPC. Oh, I don't know, but it's like sometimes people want it. So we're going to be in the same place, right? We're going to be in the same meeting room? Either this room or downstairs, I'm not sure. And so, if, because I think marijuana internal working group is down there then, too. So if you want to make it 10.15, Mr. Steinberg, or even 10 o'clock, and then we just Let's we just come to order yeah, late. Yeah, so when we get there, yeah. it starts okay. late. Let's say it starts late is fine, but that way, 10 o'clock. Okay. Quorum, it doesn't start. Yeah. That's right. And that <laughs> way, and it, but that way, if you... Great. Thank good. you. You've got it figured out. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. And then I did want to talk to you about the ba what it, what the ballot will look like. So when Ms. Burgess does the ballot, she takes the ballot that has the most races on it. So Precinct 9 may have 16 people running for town meeting. And then she sets that up and places the question wherever it winds up underneath the, the, the races. And then for other precincts if they may only have four names she doesn't move the question the question stays where it is so you might have four four races and then a lot of white space but it's to make sure that's presented to all the voters in the same way and if it's at say at the bottom and it, it might leak over to the It'll back rack. the idea is to have the question on the front so people know there's a question her fear is that people won't remember she will instruct her election workers to make sure you turn it over but people forget they for, you know they get flustered mm -hmm. or something so her goal is to try to make sure it gets on the front at least the question itself maybe not the summary as much of it as can be on the front mm -hmm. but it's going to be defined by the most um, contested race up there so that's how she does it but we will see I'll, I'll, I will see a draft of it before it goes yeah. she's willing to show that to me it goes to the printer the printer looks at it does up a mock-up sends it back and then we can look at it well it's helpful to know why it why it's like that yeah, so why people will say just, why do you have all this space so you're yeah. doing you know that it's because sense. it's to treat every every precinct yeah. the same right. versus someone saying oh you're trying to game the right. system by so pushing one it precinct might have it way up at the top and the one with it would be right not right for others races would have it. and so right. yeah. place that the same in each one 
totally makes sense. Yeah. Anything else? So um, next up is member reports. Does anyone have something? I do a little bit. Um, Mr. Steinberg, would you like to start? I'll just be really quick on three things because I know it's getting late. Um, one is on the appointment process since we just uh, threw that. I wanted to sort of acknowledge that we're continuing to work along at this point with our um, endless transition, but uh, Ms. Kruger and I have been working very effectively together really as a two-person team on it. And um, so I, I really appreciate all that I've learned about the process from her. One of the things that has come up and uh, is that um, we've sort of begun to realize that a well-intentioned system of interviews has begun to weigh down the process a lot. We've done a lot of good work with it, but um, we um, have been giving some thought and we'll come back to you with um, a more concrete recommendation on how we might modify the system to have it work effectively for the greatest number of the committees and work effectively for all of the staff and volunteers, including members of this board who are involved. Secondly, um, as far as Sister Cities is concerned, um, I've had discussions with the chair of the Kanagasaki committee. They are, are just um, engaging in a process, um, actually starting this meeting tomorrow evening, about really thinking about what is some of the future goals for their committees and an issue that I had raised in the letter that I had sent to Ms. Johnson on behalf of the board that one has to be really uh, thoughtful about what is the goals of the sister city process. Um, and received a um, email today, which I have not had a chance to respond to, ironically, from the La Paz Centro Committee Chair, essentially saying that she wanted to talk to somebody from the select board, and it sounded like it was the same kind of an issue. So this is actually a good time to um, sort of see where the existing sister city committees are, so that I would suggest that if we uh, have our um, chair and vice chair receive a request to add a th third sister city that we wait until uh, probably um, April after the town election before we actually take that up, both to know what the form of government is going to be going forward and to make sure that we get adequate feedback um, from the two existing sister city committees about their status and challenges before we start taking on a third. Uh, and uh, the last thing just to report on is that um, I think I reported previously that I've been working with uh, Ms. Kruger and Mr. Bachman um, and uh, as is uh, the chair of the um, Fire Station DPW Study Committee, um, Lynn Grismer, with um, um, four people for, who are um, from Mothers Out Front and associated groups who are involved in drafting the original net zero energy bylaw about um, whether we um, um, whether we can collaboratively create some modifications to the bylaw to make it more workable, um, but with the thought that it's something that, of course, um, we we've always felt was a, needed to be done and that it's still a work in progress. And um, But I really wanted to um, thank all of the people who were involved for coming forward and some, and actually, uh, few additional community volunteers who've offered expertise um, in what is a very good process, but there's really not anything to report additional tonight. Thank you. Other reports? Sure. So um, just to add um, about the um, looking at some ways to possibly streamline some of the committee interviews, um, we had, um, I had drafted and, and Mr. Stemmerich had reviewed a memo that would be essentially to Mr. Bachelman, but uh, also to the select board. So um, we've kind of done that, but it uh, it wasn't on tonight's agenda. And I, I uh, asked Mr. Um, 
Slaughter to consider that and decide when it would be appropriate. So I think the whole board probably has some interest in, in a short discussion about how we uh, might change what's really a practice, it's not a rule or regulation, uh, might become something that we add to the select board guidebook because that section predates when we started doing these interviews. Um, and just in, in terms of the work to revise or rewrite the um, zero net energy bylaw, uh, at least within our little group, felt it really needed to, that means the four, not the collaborative discussion, really felt that that bylaw needed to be rewritten and that meant, that, we, that would mean bringing it to town meeting probably for the annual meeting. And I, I just wanted to add what Mr. Steinberg was talking about because we might feel that way, but it's really going to be this board that decides that we would be sponsoring a, yet a different version of a, of a zero net or called similarly bylaw. And we would have until I think the April 2nd signing of the warrant to work on that would be sponsored by the select board. So I just wanted a little chance without getting into the nuts and bolts of what we're doing. Um, it was just starting out in this collaborative process, but just I wanted to know that we're thinking that and would want to know if the full board kind of agrees that we would go ahead um, and work on that. Uh, go, we're going in that direction of drafting a new bylaw and bringing it to the annual town meeting. Personally, I'd say that's, that would be all right. I think that we should, I mean, if we can get it crafted in, in time and, and, you know, articulate the sort of pieces that need to be there. And I would say, yes, we should try to do that because I think that as it currently stands, it's unintentionally obstructive to certain things. And, and that is not, that wasn't, I don't think the, the folks intention when they put it forward. Um, but I think it is in that, in that way now. And so if we can find some things that we can fine tune about it to make it more functional than that, I think it's beneficial regardless of what happens in the March election and all that sort of stuff, but. Strategy wise, it's hard to sit there in a, in, these, in a discussion and say, we think we want to do this, but the we is really this body. And so we, that's a deliberation and right. wanted to make sure you guys were on board. So along those lines, just to be clear about the deadlines. So yeah, we don't sign the warrant till the second, but we're supposed to look at it on March 19th and the internal warrant review where hopefully, usually legal counsel looks at it before they show up on a Friday morning and look at it for the first time with the whole group of people, because I don't consider that to be very efficient, um, is March 16th in terms of language. So it, there is some, some pressure there in terms track. of a fast track, but- um, Push it up. As we go with different versions. But we know that associated with all other kinds of articles that are coming up, boiling up through things. But it seems so far away, but it's really not, as it turns out. It's only about a month. Yeah. Just over a month. That's right. Any other sort of member report things um, for you? Oh, come on, talk no. about Meryl. I, I can't think of anything. Okay, parking. that's fine. What? You're not, you're not gonna I'm out. not going to talk about parking, but um, <laughs> but, uh, but well, we had it, it's it's hard. We had we we were trying to sort of plow through a bunch of stuff on the day of that snowstorm, and town hall was closing, and we were meeting, and it um, it felt a little disjointed, and and my idea for our next meeting, which was looking for the date and can't find because my calendars won't synchronize. Um, to kind of pull back and look at the six month six month goal program, the work plan, and really get the group talking with each other about where they want to go because we just you know being sort of so task focused and trying to get this done and that done and what about this street and that. So I think we're just and we will have our new member officially on and. Um, to just sort of have it be more of a working session to kind of see if we can gel around where we're going. Because we are getting near um, maybe closure on another set of recommendations. And there has been um, commentary from a number of people, and you'll probably see this in the paper. I got a letter um, from Mr. Vickery, Attorney Vickery, who's the now chair of the 
uh, president of the chamber board saying he had a real issue with the six to eight enforcement hours. Others have had that issue. And then Mr. Mersbeck from the Gazette called me. So I think because um, Mr. Vickery sent it to the paper as well. So there'll be something about that. And that's the issue that I think the downtown parking working group, but I have to get them all to agree to this, will probably take up first to evaluate or reevaluate. So we did a number of changes and the uh, thinking is it takes four to six months of a change before people really learn it and are used to it. So that's the general idea about we did a bunch of changes, let's give it some time to see how it works. We think we're going to front load a conversation about the six to eight enforcement hours because that seems to be the biggest area of concern and contention. But we're not going to do it at our next meeting because I want that to be some space to kind of figure out and, and get them to say, how do you want to talk about that at maybe two meetings out. So that's just a little, you know, news from the front. And I notice we're into puns tonight since you're talking about plowing through issues on the meeting oh, of the day no. of a snowstorm. <laughs> oh no, I, was, I missed that one. So I'm going to ask about parking, um, something God. that came to our attention. I know you're going to love this, but um, one of the things I hope that when the downtown parking working group reports back to the select board on the status of those conversations, that it, we're reminded of why we did that eight o'clock to begin with, because I didn't like it and I wasn't the only one that didn't like it and I, I really don't like it now that I have my parking ticket to wave around. 7 and p.m. So, is a peak, 7 p.m. Yeah, is a peak, 7 p.m. is, is a why, peak. why, right, but at this point, the people who are giving me feedback, I'll act like none of them wanted. Like, no one in town wanted it. I'm like, hmm, because somebody wanted it, because that's why we agreed to do it. So it would be useful to remind us where that ori idea originated and to make sure that <clears throat> they've rethought their position, whoever that was. So that would be helpful. And the other issue is that I'm concerned about the fact that the senior center is still issuing parking stickers and, in fact, is advertising it on the front page of their newsletter that they're advertising parking stickers that not only are for use at the senior center, which is something we've talked about for years, and there was an informal program started to make sure that both volunteers and participants in programs had relatively easy parking. It's now being advertised as parking for use at the cinema, for shopping, et cetera. This is like so not part of the system, and we talked about this several times this when part we were starting of this report? conversation. This and, and so what I'm saying is, how else am I going to get this on somebody's agenda? It's downtown on parking our agenda. Because on we, our agenda. we need to hear back about that it's because we're getting, because this it, is just working in isolation. You're, you're worried about so. it's being Excellent. About. I'm sure it's, it's on your agenda right. list somewhere, just like we have a Google Doc in theory of what our agenda it, items it's are. It's more too. than that. Don't, you don't <laughs> to worry about parking in that way. It's, I just got am it. concerned about people being I know sold parking stickers. I know you're, I know you're concerned. Yes. So thank you. I appreciate that. And I, you know, there's probably other things that uh, need to be dealt with as well. So thank you. I appreciate that. And um, hearing the timing on that, because obviously we're going into town meeting and everything else going on associated with that. In terms of member reports, that was, I really just wanted to mention that as we knew last time, because Ms. Kruger had already testified that morning. I testified the next day. Ms. Fetterman went with me. She, cho she chose not to speak. The meeting that you were at, the hearing you were at, was much bigger than the one in Greenfield, partly the size of the room kind of, I think, influenced that. We didn't have a bunch of legislators at ours like had been at the first one. We didn't end up in the newspaper. There was like zero coverage of that one. So it was lucky that we hit both hearings because you never know which one's going to be the popular one. And so we'll be very curious to see um, what comes out of the CCC from that because as we mentioned earlier in the conversation, they're getting a ton of feedback from the Baker administration, various agencies saying, Speaker of the House, everybody's saying, wait, 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 wait. So it'll be very interesting to see what they actually take into account and what they change for their deadline. I think they're planning to have it done by March 9th for March 15th, and that will be more or less what the regs are. So if you have any additional input on that, then Ms. Kruger and I could take that into account. We have another meeting on Thursday associated with that, and we're also talking about tweaks to town meeting associated uh, at, town, at annual town meeting to that word. Uh, establishments or retailers, for example, 
that kind of thing. Again, not getting too far ahead of ourselves because we don't know what some of the regulations are actually going to look like. And Black History Month was Saturday morning, and it was not horribly freezing cold like it often has been, so that was really nice. And it was a little, and so we appreciate that the flag went up previously and then was raised again at that event. And for those out in the viewing public, we're always looking for more people to help organize that event. But it went off without a hitch, so thank you for making too. sure. Yeah, it actually, it was, it was nice. And one of, and one of the, um, as you all know, one of the members of our Human Rights Commission so happens to be in an acapella group. So we even got to have um, additional entertainment that we don't normally have, so that was very helpful. Mr. Wall. I feel I should talk a lot because I'm not even at 10:30 yet, and not as young. But exactly, <laughs> keep going. We talked about Black History Month, so we still have my report. Um, another thing is that on on Sunday I attended the annual meeting of the Historical Society, which had a very interesting lecture about fashion uh, and textile collections, but also was a presentation of the Conk Award for service to Amherst history to Jonathan Tucker, our former planning director and historical commission liaison. Uh, so that was a nice event, uh, honoring someone who's done a lot too support town committees and generally encourage the study of the town's past. So anything else from anyone? I, would, I just have a couple of quick things. Um, first and foremost is the AGCOM is going to meet tomorrow evening where it will take up and I will help sort of paint the picture of uh, the second meter for agricultural use. So I'll, I'll try to report back their, their feedback in case they don't get an opportunity to send us a little note uh, or memo on that before meeting on the 26th, um, they are still looking for members, so I'm going to make a plug for Can I say something about EdCom? Well, um, they had run into um, the chair, Rebecca Friquet, and this issue of um, membership in this nine-member board, um, exp you know, maybe you could also talk to them about they had um, an interest in, in a Warren article to reduce the size of their commission because it really has to come from them. She said she just you know needed to think about it or talk about it. But because we have these deadlines and you know what the deadlines are, we were talking about them earlier. I think if you could bring that information to them about what they would need to do by when, and if they wanted to, because there just aren't that many active farmers. That's part of the problem. That's right. one of the reasons, and um, it's been very hard for them. Right, and I, I I have mentioned to them in other meetings previously yeah. about. Yeah that I would check to make sure that state law didn't prohibit the it, fewer than nine, and it does not. I looked yeah, it up. Yeah, okay, good. So, so that's their ag choice. commissions don't have to be nine. We happen to pick nine, so <laughs> it can be less than nine. Following up on that, since you did check MGL, thank you, um, is that the other alternative we could do, which we haven't done often but has been done for Human Rights Commission, is we could lower the quorum number. Without that's the going other thing back we to could do. Well. They were created by town meeting. If they meeting. were created by town meeting, then the mas assumption is majority other than, but that would be another alternative if they thought they would suddenly have enough farmers to do it, but they really only need be. X amount of it's, people. That's another alternative, but field. it would still have to go to town meeting. Right. It's not a field that's trending, although with marijuana cultivation, that could change, and that is it actually changed. a new pool of people, but we're just not there yet. Quite there yet. Right. And that may be one of the topics. I haven't looked at the agenda yet for, for tomorrow night, so they may have that on their agenda. They may not, but I'm sure it will be one yeah. that they do take up before too terribly long. The other thing I'll report on is the uh, Affordable Housing Trust met. Um, we're still in process on working on a policy that, again, as I mentioned before, we're, we're going to, the trust is going to adopt and seek adoption from planning board, select board, et cetera. Um, but again, it's probably well into March before we'll have that in a form that will come to us that then we can offer our feedback on and, and that sort of thing. Um, the other thing, just to East Street School, um, as Mr. Zomek hinted at, you know, the the, um, the trust has been interested in that piece of property. We're, we're actually, we, we, we voted to authorize a little small bit of spending to do a little due diligence work on the property. Um, it's potentially very wet. It's obviously frozen right now, so we can't <laughs> do the work until it gets warm out. But uh, it's, unless something really extraordinary happens, it's likely that we will have come to us an article from them for, uh, you know, Custody. custody of the property with probably with both parts with the disposition about, with the disposition but author, time author, limited authority to dispose right authority to, to look at it for you know for specific purposes but also a time horizon um, 
And again, it may be one of those things where I, I indicated it's like, let's not do this as a petition article. Let's do this through the committee process and we'll work with you on that. And, and uh, but the deadlines are coming up. But I also said, you know, if we get to a place, we do the small due diligence work and we realize it's not going to work, we can just yep. dismiss it when right. we get to town meeting. And there's no right. deal there. So I thought it would be better for it to come through the formal process. And so that, that will come to us sooner than later because it will be something that, uh, well, like you were saying, March 19th is going to be our, our review of that. We may. So it'll be before that we'll we'll probably start to see hints about it. We had rough language at the meeting the other night. It's still got a few more got things to do. Once left to get ready. So, uh, and those are the things I wanted to mention to you folks. And so I believe, unless someone has anything else, we've exhausted ourselves oh, and the meeting agenda. So I would take a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 <coughs>